I have often said that the lure of flying is the lure of beauty, that the reason flyers fly, whether they know it or not, is the aesthetic appeal of flying. Amelia Earhart. As a flight instructor, you have the opportunity to help others experience the beauty of flight. The mediocre teacher tells. The good teacher explains. The superior teacher demonstrates. The great teacher inspires. William A. Ward. As a teacher, you not only have the ability to impart knowledge, you can also inspire and make dreams come true. The cockpit was my office. It was a place where I experienced many emotions and learned many lessons. It was a place of work, but also a keeper of dreams. Brian Schul. Flight instructing allows you to turn your passion for aviation into your profession. What better office window exists than the windscreen of an airplane? Up to this point in your aviation career, you focused primarily on becoming a better pilot by increasing your aviation knowledge and improving your flying skills. During your journey toward becoming a certificated flight instructor, CFI, you learn how to pass on your knowledge and skills. The process begins with exploring basic learning theories and teaching techniques. Understanding the brain's ability to receive and store information, as well as examining individual learning styles and the communication process, lays the basic foundation necessary to become a successful teacher. In addition, early in your CFI training, you learn how to plan lessons and discover a wide variety of teaching methods and you study the most effective ways to critique and evaluate performance. While you acquire an understanding of the foundations of learning and teaching, you also begin learning to operate the airplane from the right seat. At first, flying from the right seat may feel awkward to you, but your instructor helps you adjust to the changes in orientation you experience, such as your view of the instrument panel. For example, your interpretation of an airspeed, altitude, or heading when looking at the instruments from an angle differs from the information seen on the displays from straight ahead. Also, you must adjust to changes in visual references outside the airplane when performing such maneuvers as steep turns or landings. With practice, you soon master both private and commercial maneuvers from the right seat. In addition to performing maneuvers from the right seat, you must also complete specific spin training required for flight instructor applicants. After you've learned the fundamentals of learning and teaching and have become proficient at controlling the airplane from the right seat, you are introduced to practice instruction. First, your instructor asks you to develop lesson plans for ground and flight instruction sessions. On the ground, you explain concepts to your instructor as you would to a student. During flight lessons, you describe and demonstrate maneuvers and procedures. Then your instructor performs maneuvers while making specific errors to simulate a student's actions. For example, to illustrate an error common to beginning students, your instructor might use improper control input to correct for a crosswind on final approach. In the case of basic attitude instrument flight, your instructor may intentionally fail to lead the rollout to a heading. When practicing commercial maneuvers, your instructor may introduce a very subtle error by using a little too much rudder pressure during a chandelle. You are expected to identify these errors and respond appropriately, perhaps by explaining or demonstrating the correct procedures. Finally, you must provide a critique of the performance and suggest means of improvement. It requires practice to become an effective instructor, especially in the cockpit where you experience a high workload. To maintain flight safety, you must be able to divide your attention between explaining procedures, controlling the airplane, and monitoring your students' actions. As you continue to practice teaching, both in the air and on the ground, you develop techniques to effectively instruct a wide variety of students. For example, when training beginning students, you concentrate on basic flying skills and help students overcome apprehension regarding maneuvers such as slow flight, stalls, takeoffs, and landings. 
you should be especially alert to issues such as collision avoidance, since beginners are normally completely focused on their assigned flying task. On the other hand, when you work with commercial students, you should emphasize the very precise flying skills needed to perform advanced maneuvers. You should also help your commercial students develop a professional attitude regarding flight operations. Once you've acquired the ability to explain procedures, demonstrate maneuvers, provide effective critiques, and properly evaluate student performance, you are ready to take the practical test. When you've successfully completed your check ride with your CFI certificate in hand, a new world of opportunities opens up to you. You may decide to enhance your flight instructing career by adding an instrument or a multi-engine rating to your certificate. You can expand your aviation knowledge and add variety to your instructing activities by giving specialized instruction. For example, providing flight reviews and instrument proficiency checks helps other pilots maintain their currency. Transition training and tailwheel instruction, as well as complex and high-performance checkouts, all provide opportunities to instruct in a wide variety of airplanes. You may also enjoy providing regional checkouts to pilots new to your area, or you may find it exciting to conduct mountain flying lessons. If you're an enthusiast of aerobatic flight or home-built aircraft, these venues may allow you to share your interest through training others. As you gain experience, you may become qualified to train the next generation of CFIs. Whether outwardly or inwardly, whether in space or time, the farther we penetrate the unknown, the vaster and more marvelous it becomes. Charles Lindbergh. Through instructing, you're not only teaching students new skills, you're helping them to grow, explore the unknown, and perhaps discover something marvelous. In teaching others, we teach ourselves. Proverb. As a flight instructor, you learn volumes about your own knowledge and abilities as you observe your students' errors and analyze their techniques. As soon as we left the ground, I knew myself that I had to fly. Amelia Earhart. Each time you lift off the runway with a new student, you can sense the same excitement that Amelia Earhart felt on her first flight. Through your students, you'll experience the joy of discovering flight again and again. One of the best ways to learn is by doing. When you become a flight instructor, you'll see firsthand how students learn, and you'll discover the best methods to effectively convey your vast amount of aviation wisdom. But you don't have to wait until you're a CFI to get a taste of the teaching experience. Welcome to the world of the flight instructor. You're about to receive a glimpse of the pilot training experience from a CFI's point of view and you never have to leave the comfort and safety of your home or office. You won't earn any money during this journey into the instructor's realm, but you will gain a wealth of knowledge about learning and teaching that you can apply when your goal of being a CFI becomes a reality. Ah, look, here comes your first student now. I just got here, so I haven't called flight service yet. I'll go hurry and get a briefing now. No need to rush, we've got plenty of time. You're doing a great job. It's nice to have a student who's always so organized. Thanks. She's been really excited about flying lately. Maybe my compliments have helped. My instructor wasn't very good at that. The only time I knew I was doing something right was when he wasn't criticizing me. Kind of like George over there. Seems like you understand VOR navigation and holds. So next time, let's do approaches. So, I did all right? Yeah, let's go schedule for next week. Wow, George didn't criticize Rick. He must have done okay today. So are we still gonna do stalls next lesson? I'd like to try more steep turns next time, and I also want you to review the procedure for slow flight before we try stalls, okay? I guess I didn't fly so well this time. You usually tell me how well I'm doing. Normally you do much better, and it did seem you, like you were a little distracted. Carl knew she did something wrong today because Liz didn't compliment her like she usually does. 
How many times have I told you to do clearing turns before you practice stalls? I know, next time. Well, there's going to be a next time if we hit somebody. You understand that? All right. He's going to so. quit soon if James keeps acting like that. What are you looking at? Sorry. I better mind my own business and double check what I'm doing with Tara. I wonder how well she understands the briefing. Well, that looks good, Bob. So, you think it's a good day to fly? Well, he said that the winds are from 180 at 7, and they're not expected to increase. So, it, landings shouldn't be a problem. There are a few scattered clouds at 10,000, and the visibility is more than 10 miles. Looks like good VFR weather to me. He did say something else about a pirate for light chop at 9,000, and I, I don't understand that part. Let me take a look. Well, the briefer was talking about a pilot report. He should have told you where, at what time, and what type of airplane made the report. Yeah, see? You have it here. Over the foothills and at 172 about an hour ago. That shouldn't be a problem for our flight. Okay, so I should go pre-flight then? Yeah, I'll be out in a couple of minutes. Okay, we're in 241. Okay. I remember when Tara was first learning. She was trying so hard to steer, she missed every call from ground. 241, hold for the Cessna to your left. 241. Now she doesn't have to think about how to taxi and she never misses a call. So, to set up for the descent, first reduce the power to about 1500 RPM. Cessna 241, you're following traffic at 11 o'clock, entering the downwind. Report that traffic in sight. Why isn't she doing anything? She must be overwhelmed. I better help her out. I have the controls. Go ahead and answer the tower. Okay, you have the controls. Tower, 241, I have the traffic in sight. I'll do the approach and landing so you can focus on the procedures. Then, I'll handle the radio so you can practice some landings. How did you feel about the landings today? The talk we had yesterday really helped. I feel better about being able to correct my mistakes. Plus, I know I can always go around if I need to. Do you understand what you did on that last landing when you got too slow? <laughs> yeah, I got low and pulled back too much instead of adding power. Right. You corrected for it, but you added the power a little too late, so the landing was still hard. Just remember, if you're at the right airspeed, pulling back only makes you slower, and you'll lose altitude right. instead of gaining it. You did a good job today. You're getting much better at stabilizing your approach speed. Next time, I'd like to see you get the power pulled back just a little sooner, so you're already slowed down and starting a descent. Here, I'll beam the numbers. Okay. Once you've got the traffic pattern and landings down, you'll be able to solo. Great. Call me as soon as you know your schedule next week. We'll need to schedule another lesson as soon as possible so you don't lose anything you've learned today. I should know this afternoon. I'll call you from work to set up a time. See you later. Bye. I hope she schedules another lesson soon or she'll forget what she's learned today, and we'll have to spend a lot of time reviewing. Speaking of review, before your next student arrives, let's back up and examine your day so far. You may be surprised at how many different aspects of learning have already been a part of your morning. I just got here, so I haven't called flight service yet. I'll go hurry and get a briefing now. According to the theory of behaviorism, Tara's habit of getting a weather briefing before every flight is an example of operant behavior. While it's something Tara does voluntarily, it's still a behavior she developed by responding to instructional cues from you during her previous lessons. Positive reinforcement, like your praise of Tara's actions, is normally the best way to strengthen operant behavior. There are some other, less effective ways to reinforce desired behavior in students. You were witness to some of these methods already this morning. Remember George? He's quick to point out when his students do poorly and is reluctant to offer any praise when they do well. His students' motivation to succeed stems from a desire to avoid criticism. George is practicing negative reinforcement. On the other hand, Liz is always eager to praise, but has a hard time addressing mistakes her students make. She doesn't know it, but she's employing a type of reinforcement known as extinction. It's difficult to use extinction in flight training since oftentimes, for safety reasons, you cannot ignore undesired behavior. 
Finally, the success of punishment to change behavior is often short-lived, and the negative consequences of this type of reinforcement, such as anxiety, fear, or anger in students, can hinder subsequent learning. Your preparation for Tara's lesson illustrates the concepts of shaping and chaining behaviors. You've already developed or shaped Tara's ability to perform basic maneuvers, ground reference maneuvers, slow flight, and stalls. Today's lesson combines or chains these maneuvers together to assemble the more complex traffic pattern and landing procedures. Learning isn't just a change in outward behavior, but involves changes in thinking, feeling, and understanding. Cognitive theory involves mental processes such as decision-making and problem-solving, which are difficult to observe or measure. Well, that looks good, Bob. Sometimes you need to be proactive to determine whether your students have learned something. So, you think it's a good day to fly? By asking Tara for an explanation of the weather briefing, you ensure she truly understands it. Tara's brain gathers, processes, and stores what you teach her through cognitive information processing. First, she receives information through her senses. Then, her brain's sensory register filters out irrelevant data by a process known as attending. The working memory codes the important information by the process of conscious thought. The long-term memory not only stores information for a lifetime, but also performs the function of reconstructing codes in the brain to form memories. When Tara sorts through all the sensory input and concentrates on what's important, she's using a feature of the sensory register called selective attention. Sometimes this causes her to miss information, such as a radio call, when she's performing a new task. However, now that taxiing has become a habit, Tara's sensory register monitors the activity while letting her think about new input. This level of performance is called automaticity. While flying the traffic pattern, each new experience is processed by Tara's working memory, then sent to her long-term memory for storage. Tara is not as familiar with the traffic pattern as she is with taxiing, so when she doesn't respond to the tower or to your instructions on downwind, it's because she's overloaded. In this case, her sensory register is taking in all the information, but her working memory can't process all the data. Normally, the working memory can only process five to nine items at any given time. Tara was better able to learn when she relinquished the controls to you. Working memory transfers information to long-term memory by two processes, rehearsing and coding. Tara will remember the approach speed by rehearsing, repeating the number until she has it memorized. The process of relating new information to concepts already in memory is referred to as coding. Tara is using her previous experience flying the airplane at slow speeds to help her master the traffic pattern. When you introduced slow flight and stalls in the practice area, you emphasized how these maneuvers apply to approach and landing. Tara's experience during flying lessons is an excellent example of constructivism. This learning concept is based on the idea that individuals construct knowledge through the process of discovery as they experience events and actively seek to understand their environment. When you first mentioned landing practice to Tara, she was hesitant. Her initial perception of landings was affected by her fear of an accident. Perceptions, which occur when meaning is given to sensations, are the basis for all learning. Time spent discussing the aerodynamics of landing and analyzing the risks involved, coupled with extensive slow flight and stall training, has helped Tara overcome her fear and form a more accurate perception of landing. The element of threat or fear that Tara felt about landings is an example of just one of the factors that may affect the ability of your students to form the correct perceptions. Another student, Chuck, is colorblind. A person who has limited abilities with one or more senses perceives differently than someone who doesn't. When basic needs, such as hunger and rest, aren't met, perceptions are altered as well. 
you need to suggest to Jennifer that she should schedule lessons earlier in the day, since she is typically very tired after work. A student's self-image also has a great influence on the perceptual process. Learning is enhanced when the student's experiences support a positive self-image. Mark is much too hard on himself. You must encourage him more, or he may quit taking lessons. Greg was devastated by poor performance during his last lesson, and he's worried about his ability to fly well enough to pursue a career as a pilot. Letting him know his mistakes are typical and easy to overcome can improve his perceptions of training. Porter doesn't schedule lessons often enough, so her progress has been very slow. Time to experience the learning event and the opportunity to build upon prior knowledge are important in formulating the proper perceptions. One of your primary responsibilities as an instructor is to help your students group perceptions together to form insights. Students can gain insights without your input, but sometimes they reach the wrong conclusions. Yeah, I got low and pulled back too much instead of adding power. For example, since climb practice typically involves the use of high power settings, students may assume that gaining altitude can be accomplished solely by pitching up. Tara's initial reaction when she was low on final may have been a result of this perception. However, your discussions and demonstrations, as well as practice of slow flight, help Tara gain the proper insight about operating at slow air speeds, allowing her to realize her mistake and correct it by adding power. While Tara's flight went well today, you've accomplished little if she doesn't retain the new information and skills she learned. You may not even realize it, but to help Tara remember what was covered, you employed several principles of retention during this lesson. For example, you associated the traffic pattern and landing procedures with other maneuvers she's performed in the past. By practicing several landings in a row, Tara benefited from meaningful repetition. However, while repetition definitely aids retention, some research indicates that three or four repetitions provide the maximum effect after which the rate of learning and probability of retention fall off rapidly. You should keep this in mind when planning lessons. During your debriefing, you praised Tara's performance. You did a good job today. You're getting much better at stabilizing your approach speed. And offered her encouragement for the next lesson's practice. Next time, I'd like to see you get the power pulled back just a little sooner, so you're already slowed down and starting a descent. Here, I beam the numbers. Okay. When you pointed out how this practice leads to the first solo, you provided her with motivation Once to remember. Once you the traffic pattern and landings down, you'll be able to solo. Great. Finally, flight lessons inherently aid recall since they involve learning with all the senses. Even if Tara's brain successfully processed today's experience into long-term memory, the information can be forgotten due to disuse. The more time that passes between the learning event and the attempted retrieval, the more likely the event will be forgotten. The information is still in the brain, but over time, the neural pathways break down between the various cells that store memories. After review and additional practice, the pathways should return. In addition to disuse, there are other reasons that Tara may forget elements of what she learned today. For example, interference occurs when material is forgotten because a separate experience has overshadowed it, or when the learning of similar things has intervened. If Tara were to fly with a friend over the weekend in a different model of airplane, she may confuse some of the procedures with those she learned today. Now that Tara's lesson is completed, you can turn your attention to your next student, Chad. Okay, thanks, Ken. See you in about 15 minutes. Hi, Bob. How's it going, Chad? Can't complain. Are we going over systems today? Yeah. Did you get a chance to read your assignment? Yeah. I read all of Chapter 11, and I read the articles you gave me about turboprop and jet engines. They were pretty interesting. Well, that's good. Instead of doing ground school, I set it up so we could go over to the hangar to look at a variety of airplanes while they're being worked on. Sounds great. Chad's going to like this. He gets to ask questions and have some hands-on experience. Hey, Ken. 
Hey, Bob. How's it going? Oh, pretty good. Good. I'd like you to meet my student, Chad. Chad, nice to meet you. Hi. Can we take a look at what you're working on? Uh, well, sure. I just got through repairing the throttle cable on a 172. What was wrong with it? Well, the thing broke off during a run-up yesterday, and the thing went to full throttle. Oh, it's a good thing that happened during run-up. Uh, what would have happened if it broke during flight? Well, basically, it did what it was designed to do, and I can show you here with this little carburetor. Um, typical carburetor has a throttle control lever, and this is where the cable would attach to. You've got a throttle plate, and you can see that this would be the idle position, and there's full throttle. When the cable broke, though, it's designed so that spring-loaded goes all the way to full throttle. That's a good design. So, do you think you got something out of talking to Ken and looking at the airplanes? Yeah, it was great to see how everything fit together. I think I understand carburetors, but I have a question about fuel injection. Here, let's look it up so we can see a diagram. He likes to think of things as pieces and then put them together to understand the whole. This type of diagram works well for Chad. See, this might help. It breaks down the injection system. So, if the engine went to full power during flight, what would you do? Well, if I move the throttle and nothing happens, I'd have to prepare for a no-power landing at the airport. Before I land, I'd have to use the mixture to shut down the engine. That's good. He always takes the time to think things out. Oh, our time is almost up. Let's turn back the clock for a moment to look more closely at your time spent with Chad today. To learn most effectively, students must see a purpose in what they're doing. Chad is intent upon making aviation his career, so he has a different motivation for learning than Tara, who regards flying as a hobby. Understanding these motivations helps you tailor lessons to your students' goals. In addition to being purposeful, several distinct characteristics of learning have become the standard. For example, learning is the result of experience. As an instructor, you're the facilitator that guides students through the learning experiences you create. To be an active process, learning must involve reading, writing, discussing, thinking, and doing. The trip to the maintenance hangar illustrates how many facets there are to learning. This experience involves many types of learning, such as verbal, conceptual, and problem solving. In addition to labeling characteristics of learning, Researchers also have identified six principles of learning that provide a foundation for basic instructional techniques. You may not have realized it, but during your lesson with Chad, you took advantage of each of these principles. By going over the POH and discussing advanced systems, you effectively prepared Chad to expand his knowledge of systems as he visited the maintenance hangar. Repeating information also serves to increase his retention of the material. This lesson has built upon Chad's interest in systems and his goal of pursuing an aviation career. Discussing troubleshooting scenarios helps him take what he's learning and apply it to the flight environment. Having his questions answered by an AMT ensures Chad learns information correctly the first time. Frequent quizzing about systems during subsequent ground lessons and practicing emergency procedures in flight will keep the material fresh in Chad's mind. Up to this point in your day, you've explored theories that can apply to most any instructional situation and to most any learner. But to truly be an effective teacher, you must do more than apply general learning theories to your instruction. You must see your students as individuals and understand that each of them absorbs information in a unique way. Exploring learning styles and domains can help you accomplish this goal. For example, Chad likes to think of things as pieces and then put them together to understand the whole. This bottom-up strategy is a serialist approach. Tara, on the other hand, is considered a holist since she looks at the overall picture first and then at individual parts, a top-down approach. Chad and Tara's learning styles differ in other respects as well. Chad exhibits left brain dominance. He's verbal, analytical, and objective. The left hemisphere of the brain specializes in linear information processing by identifying and isolating individual parts of a whole. 
right brain individuals like Tara are more creative, intuitive, and emotional. They may be very good with art or music and can easily put together the big picture. While Chad considers his options, his reflective nature can sometimes cause problems. For example, when taking a test, Chad sometimes cannot finish in time, or he may overanalyze questions and change answers from right to wrong. Tara, on the other hand, is somewhat impulsive. During emergency landing practice, she tends to pick the first field available and overlook more suitable options. In addition to the learning styles that apply to how students process information, there are learning styles based upon the dominant sense involved in the learning process. Auditory, kinesthetic, or visual. Tara learns primarily by listening, Chad by doing, and your next student, Mike, by watching. You can tailor your teaching to accommodate all three of these learning styles. Hey, Mike. Hey, Bob. I'll be with you in just a minute. Chad, why don't you schedule the 182 tomorrow at 9? All right, I'll see you tomorrow. See ya. So, are you ready to try an ILS today? Well, I studied the charts you gave me, and I think I understand the procedures, but actually implementing them is going to be a whole other thing. We'll give it a shot. All right. Let's check out the simulator. I hope he can apply what he's learned so far. He had a hard time when we first started practicing VOR and NDB approaches. Your speed looks good, Mike. What do you need to do next? Well, when I hit Cassie, I need to intercept the localizer outbound. And what altitude do you need to be at? I should be at 8,000 when I hit Cassie. Actually, you need to stay at 9,000 until you're done with the procedure turn. Take a look at your approach plate. I've pulled this approach three times now, and I still can't seem to stay on altitude. Well, let's take a break and just practice some altitude and heading changes. Then we'll try this approach again. He's a little overwhelmed trying to put together all the new procedures. Maybe trying something else for a while will help. I'll give him a pattern to fly that's like the approach. So, are you ready to try that approach again? Sure. I hope practicing those patterns helps. I feel much better about the approach now. Yeah, you did great. You held your altitude well that last time, and you stayed on the localizer pretty much the whole way. Let's take a look at what we're going to do tomorrow. I'd like to do the same approach that we shot today, but in the airplane. Well, when we shoot this approach for real, won't we be getting radar vectors rather than doing the procedure turn? Yeah, but when we practice it in the airplane, let's do it with the procedure turn first, then we'll ask for vectors to the final. And then we'll be talking with Denver Approach? Yeah, they have a specific frequency for practice approaches. Great, I'll see you tomorrow. See ya. Hello? Hi, this is Kristen Ossie. We talked last week about flying lessons. I remember. Well, I'd like to schedule that intro flight tomorrow if you still have the time. Sure. Would you like to meet me at the FBO, say, at 1700Z? I'll call flight service and get a briefing for the practice area before we go up. What? Stop. Rewind. Try again. Meet me at 9 o'clock at the building called TAC Air. It's south of the tower. You'll see signs for it as you drive into the airport. Ask for me at the first counter you see when you walk in the door. There'll be a sign over the counter that says Wings Aviation. I'll check to see if the weather is good for our flight. And if it isn't, I'll give you a call by 8 o'clock. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. My phone must be cutting out. I was just saying that I'll check and make sure the weather is okay, and I'll call you by 8 o'clock if it isn't. That sounds good. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Okay, thanks. See you tomorrow. Hey, Bob. Oh, hey, Brent. Hey, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. The other day when I was out flying, I noticed the low voltage light come on. I think I did the right thing, but I wanted to check with you. I remember a story you told in class once about a similar situation that had happened to you. Yeah, well, that was back in my less experienced days, and I actually did the wrong thing at first. We were over the mountains, and I noticed a discharge on the ammeter before I saw the light, so I had no idea how long we were running on battery power. That wasn't the smartest thing to do, so I didn't have any radios by the time we got back to the airport. Well, I shut everything off once I noticed the light come on, so I did have radios by the time I got back to the airport. But I guess I could have recycled the master switch. Yeah, you should have done that first. You might have been able to reset the alternator, but it sounded like you handled everything okay. All right, thanks for your help. Sure, anytime. Oops, I'm running behind schedule. I better get going. Whoa, stop. Before you head to your class, take some time to reflect on the rest of your morning. 
By examining Mike's lesson in the simulator, you can easily identify the four basic levels of learning traditionally included in aviation instructor training. The first level is rote learning. This is the simple memorization of information without the understanding or ability to apply what has been learned. Mike can identify the symbols on the approach chart by rote learning. The next level, understanding, is the ability to explain the how and why of facts. How do the chart symbols apply to flying the approach? Application is the act of putting your knowledge into practical use. Mike uses his knowledge to perform an ILS approach in the simulator. Correlation is associating what has been learned, understood, and applied with previous or subsequent learning. The goal of your instruction is for Mike to associate all the information he's learned about instrument procedures with operating effectively in actual IFR conditions. In addition to the four learning levels, psychologists have developed three domains of learning, cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. You can create lesson objectives that focus on one or more of these domains. The cognitive domain is the category of learning concerned with knowledge and thought processes, such as studying instrument approach procedures. The psychomotor domain applies to hands-on learning skills, such as pre-flighting an airplane, performing a landing, or flying an instrument approach. The affective domain focuses on feelings, attitudes, personal beliefs, and values. Be aware that students normally experience a learning plateau at some point during their training. In Mike's case, he's trying to master new skills, so he must learn to divide his attention to perform many tasks at the same time. Some students experience a learning plateau if they've reached capability limits or if they misunderstand some aspect of the task. A lack of motivation can also curb learning. If you believe your student has reached a plateau, you may need to try a different teaching method to help increase progress. If having Mike fly the patterns you developed helps him to perform the approach better, a positive transfer of learning has occurred. On the other hand, if previous learning interferes with understanding of the current task, a negative transfer of learning takes place. When you exchange ideas with your students, you've participated in the communication process. Your post-flight discussion with Mike provides a way to look at some of the primary elements involved in this process. During this interaction, you're the source of the communication. Mike is the receiver, and the words and illustrations you use are the symbols that convey the message. Let's take a look at what we're going to do tomorrow. Well, when we shoot this approach for real, won't we be getting radar vectors rather than doing the procedure turn? Yeah, when we practice it in the The airport, feedback Mike provides is very important because it helps you determine whether he understands your message. If Mike doesn't yeah, provide you with enough feedback, you should ask for it. Great, I'll see you tomorrow. See While you. your discussion with Mike was very productive, your initial conversation with your new student, Kristen, was less effective. Hello? Hi, this is Kristen Ossie. We spoke last week about flying lessons. I remember. Well, I'd like to schedule that intro flight tomorrow, if you still have the time. Sure. Would you like to meet me at the FBO, say, at 1700Z? I'll call flight service and get a briefing for the practice area before we go up. What? So what was wrong with this conversation? It was hindered by several barriers to effective communication. As a new student with a lack of aviation experience, Kristen does not understand terms that are second nature to you, such as FBO, Zulu time, or flight service. Also, Kristen misinterpreted some of your words. For example, when you mentioned the briefing for the practice area, she was confused and concluded that you were talking about familiarizing yourself with the subject area you were going to practice on the flight. In addition, meet me at the FBO is too abstract. There are no specifics as to where Kristen should look for you in the building or whether she needs to ask for you at a particular place. Your second attempt at communicating with Kristen was much more effective. Meet me at 9 o'clock in the building called TAC Air. It's south of the tower. You'll see signs for it as you drive into the airport. Ask for me at the first counter you see when you walk in the door. 
There'll be a sign over the counter that says Wings Aviation. I'll check to see if the for our flight. If it isn't, I'll get call by 8 o'clock. Still, there was a problem with the exchange. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that last part. My phone must be cutting out. I was just saying that I'll check the The trouble with the, the phone is, okay. is an example of interference. Often, good. interference is beyond your direct control. Okay, However, there may be times when you can lessen its impact. For example, in the noisy cockpit environment, headsets can eliminate some interference. Communication skills oh, hey, need to be developed, hey, practiced, yeah. and yeah, continually improved upon. Like Discussing your own experiences with to your to students, you. as you did with Remember Brent, can enhance uh, instructional communication. Yeah, well, that was back in my less experienced days. I actually did the wrong thing at first. See, we were over the mountains and I noticed a discharge on the ammeter before I saw the light. So I had no idea how long we were running on Listening is the most frequently used communication do, skill, so yet it remains the least mastered. You can help your students make the transition from simply hearing to effectively listening by suggesting they take steps such as taking notes or focusing on the main ideas in a discussion. Well, I shut everything off once I noticed the light come on, so I did have radios by the time I got back to the airport. But I guess I could have recycled the master switch. Not only do you need to help your students develop effective listening skills, but you need to develop and practice your own listening skills as well. For example, avoid rehearsing answers while listening and don't insist on the last word. From early morning flights to afternoons in the classroom, you've had the opportunity to briefly delve into the flight instructor's universe. You've witnessed the learning process from a perspective that may soon become very familiar to you as a CFI with a full schedule of students. Once you're a full-fledged flight instructor, you'll reap rewards above and beyond the monetary compensation, such as the satisfaction of seeing your students achieve. And likewise, your students will undoubtedly benefit from not only your aviation expertise, but also from your extensive knowledge of how they learn. If you're an aspiring CFI, you've been a student in the past, and the learner's role in the training process is familiar to you. However, during your experiences as a student, you might not have thought about the methods your instructors used to convey information. Students often pass judgments on various aspects of their training without analyzing the reasons behind the success or failure of a particular learning experience. Oh great, I'm more confused about airspace after watching that video. I learned so much today. I never thought I'd be able to land an airplane, but now I've got the hang of it. What a lousy CFI. I had a hard time learning anything from him. My new instructor is much better. Which instructional methods work and which don't? What techniques are best suited to particular subjects? How can material be presented in the most effective manner? These questions are answered best by examining teaching from a student's perspective. This program lets you step back into a student pilot's shoes, allowing you to take a more critical look at the art and science of teaching. Your private pilot ground school class is about to begin. Bob's your instructor. Afternoon, everyone. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Okay, so last time we covered airport facility directories and sectional charts. Today I'd like to discuss airspace. Uh, Scott, what were you telling me this morning? Something about class D airspace around Jeffco? Yeah, I went up yesterday to practice some maneuvers, and after finding a road to uh, practice my S turns on, um, I kind of forgot where I was, and I wandered into a Jeffco's class D airspace. Did you call a tower? Yeah, they weren't happy about it either, but um, I think they understood what happened, and they're definitely glad I finally contacted them. Oh, yeah, you did the right thing. Thanks a lot for sharing your story. I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. That's all right. But hopefully the things we cover today will uh, help prevent some of those situations. Go ahead and take an outline and pass it on. We'll get started. Today we'll discuss all the types of uh, airspace. We'll talk about controlled and uncontrolled airspace, weather I minimums. I didn't completely understand this stuff when I read the assignment. I'm glad we'll be going over it today. Okay, 
So that's it for weather minimums and equipment requirements for both controlled and uncontrolled airspace. Are there any questions? I have a question. Okay. You need mode C transponder within class A, B, and C airspace within 30 miles of a class B airport and above class C. And where else? Whenever you're flying above 10,000 feet MSL, unless you're below 2,500 feet AGL. Okay, good. Are there any other questions? All right, let's break up into groups of three or four. I'll pass out some sectionals. We'll go over a few examples. So if you guys All right, here's a scenario. You're flying south from Jeffco to Pueblo, on to Front Range, then back to Jeffco. Let's start at Jeffco. What are the basic VFR weather minimums needed to take off? Well, without getting a special VFR clearance, I'd need a thousand foot ceiling and three miles visibility. Correct. And what's the ceiling of Jeff Coach Class D airspace? Uh, it would be 8,000, actually 7,999 feet since Denver's Class B airspace starts at 8,000. Good. Would we end up flying through Denver's airspace or around it? Good question. What do you think would be best? All right, well, that's it for today. So, oh, before I forget, some of you are asking about computer-based training. So I brought some flight maneuver CDs and some test prep software. If anyone wants to borrow some, just let me know. See you next week. Good. I wanted to check out that maneuvers training CD. Hey, Bob. Yeah? I was wondering if one of those CDs has crosswind landings on it. I've been having problems with those lately. OK, let me see what I have. Yeah, there you go. Oh, thanks. I mean, no, hey, that works out for you. Say, by the way, did today's class clear up some of the confusion you had about airspace? Yeah, going through those scenarios and listening to everyone's comments really helped answer my questions. Good, glad it helped. Hopefully next week's class will help too. Okay, see, see you then. Ya. So do you have any more questions? No, I think that's it. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, hey, Lori. Hey. Hey, Mark. Hi, Kelly. Okay, I'll see you next week okay, then. Okay, sounds good. Great. So how was your class? It was good. Bob answered a lot of questions I had about airspace. Great, that'll help a lot with the cross countries we'll be planning later this week. So are you about ready to go? Yeah, let me go get the weather briefing and I'll go out and pre-flight and I'll meet you back here. Okay. Okay, think you're ready to try one? Sure, I want to use full flaps, right? Yeah, the idea is to land and stop in the shortest distance possible. Try to touch down so you can turn off at that first taxiway. Don't forget to keep an eye on your airspeed. We're a little low and slow. Try adding a little power. Darn, there, that's better. for your first try. I guess. I made the taxiway, but I was a little slow, and I think that's why the landing was so hard. That's okay. You just need a little more practice, that's all. Much better. Hmm. Let's see. Go ahead and taxi back, and I'll show you how to do a soft field takeoff. Sounds good. I'll demonstrate a soft field takeoff and landing, then see if you can talk me through the procedure before you try some yourself. Okay. 
Now, remember to hold the yoke all the way back to keep pressure off the nose wheel as we taxi onto the runway. Also, we want to keep the airplane moving since we're simulating taking off from a grass field. Before you finish your flight, let's take a look back at your day. You may be surprised at the number of teaching methods your instructors used in one afternoon. Okay, so last time we covered airport facility directories and sectional charts. Today I'd like to discuss airspace. Your instructors facilitate the teaching process by creating practical instructional sessions that are conducive to learning. The steps Bob followed to teach this class effectively were preparation, presentation, application, and review and evaluation. Of course, as a student, you never see the preparation phase. However, for an instructor, this is perhaps the most critical step. In order to measure how well his students understood the lecture, Bob wrote performance-based objectives prior to class. These objectives set measurable, reasonable standards that describe desired student performance. Bob organized his lesson by developing an introduction, instructional sequences that outline the material to be covered, and a conclusion. The introduction sets the stage for the rest of the lesson by relating the coverage of the material to the entire course. Uh, Scott, what were you telling me this morning? Something about class the airspace around Jeffco? Yeah, I went up yesterday to practice some maneuvers, and after finding a road to... Uh, by starting class with a story relating to airspace, Bob provided a real-world example of the importance of this lesson to your private pilot training. In addition, Bob got your attention, which helped you gain interest in the lesson. Oh, yeah, you did the right thing. Thanks a lot for sharing your story. I didn't mean to put you on the spot like that. But hopefully the things we cover today will uh, help prevent some of those situations. Since you obviously don't want to make the same mistake Scott did, you are motivated to pay close attention to what Bob says. The motivation element offers specific reasons why the lesson content is important. Go ahead and take an outline and pass it on. We'll get started. Today we'll discuss all the types of uh, airspace. We'll talk about controlled and uncontrolled airspace, weather minimums, and equipment requirements. Bob's brief overview of the lesson gave you an idea of what to expect from the class, and the outline he passed out provided a more detailed description. The introduction to every lesson should include an overview of the subjects to be covered during the period. After introducing the lesson, Bob presented the material in a structured way to provide a logical sequence for his students to follow and to ensure that all items were covered. Finally, Bob's conclusion reiterated the main points of the lesson and related them to the objective. Since each teaching situation is unique, the setting and purpose of the lesson determines the teaching method used. Lecture, cooperative learning, guided discussion, demonstration performance, telling and doing technique, integrated method of instruction, computer-based training, or a combination of two or more methods. The lecture is probably the most common teaching method used in ground schools. Lectures typically introduce new material, summarize ideas, show relationships between theory and practice, and re-emphasize main points within a course of study. There are many different types of lectures, such as the illustrated talk, the briefing, the formal lecture, and the teaching lecture. By encouraging his students' participation, Bob presented a teaching lecture in an informal manner. All right, let's break up into groups of three or four. I'll pass out some sectionals. We'll go over a few examples. Cooperative or group learning is a teaching method that incorporates small groups of individuals who work together to maximize each other's learning. The guided discussion method is particularly useful during classroom instruction and during pre- and post-flight briefings after students have gained some knowledge and experience with the topic presented. In a guided discussion, learning is achieved through an instructor's skillful use of questions and includes elements similar to the cooperative learning method of teaching. The demonstration performance method is based on the principle that students learn by doing. This method is well suited for teaching skills such as cross-country planning or flight maneuvers. Remember your flight this afternoon? Mark explained how to do a short field landing. Then, he demonstrated one, watched while you tried one, and finally, evaluated your performance. 
To apply the demonstration performance method to flight instruction, Mark used the telling and doing technique. This technique is particularly suited to teaching physical skills, so it's valuable when learning flight maneuvers and procedures. Now, remember to hold the yoke all the way back to keep pressure off the nose wheel as we taxi onto the runway. Also, we want to keep the airplane moving since we're simulating taking off from a grass field. The telling and doing technique begins with preparation prior to the lesson. During the lesson, Mark explained and demonstrated the soft field takeoff and landing techniques. After this, you explained the techniques while Mark flew. Then, you applied your knowledge as you talked through your actions while controlling the airplane. Finally, Mark reviewed the procedures and evaluated your performance. Don't forget to keep an eye on your airspeed. We're a little low and slow. Try adding a little power. Darn! There. That's better. Mark uses the integrated method of flight instruction, which teaches students to reference outside visual cues, as well as flight instruments while performing maneuvers. For example, during your lesson, Mark pointed out the relationship of the airspeed indicator to your outside reference. The integrated method includes instruction on the function of flight controls, the instrument indications to be expected, as well as the outside references used in attitude control. Using the integrated method typically allows all flight maneuvers and operations to be performed with added precision, not just those that require reference to flight instruments. Another instructing method available to CFIs is computer-based training, CBT, also referred to as computer-based instruction, CBI. The CBT Bob loaned you combines video, graphics, and interactivity to explore private pilot maneuvers. You are able to choose exactly what topic you want to examine and the pace at which you navigate the program. Since aviation training is wide-ranging and dynamic, entrusting an entire course to a computer program is not practical. So during Computer Assisted Instruction, CAI, the computer is used as a tool in combination with another form of instruction. Other forms of instruction can be pursued at your local airport through fixed base operators. Some FBOs offer instrument instruction in personal computer-based aviation training devices, PCATDs, or flight training devices, FTDs. This instruction can be credited toward the portion of time needed for an instrument rating. Major airlines have sophisticated flight simulators that are so realistic, transitioning pilots may meet all the qualifications needed to act as crew members by receiving all type specific aircraft time in the simulator alone. A few days after your class on airspace, you're at the airport bright and early for a ground school session on cross-country flight planning with Mark. So did you get a chance to watch that cross-country planning video? Yeah. I had no idea there's so much to know. Yeah, don't worry. We'll cover everything in detail. I was just hoping that video would at least give you an introduction into planning trips. Oh, it did. Good. Good. Well, with my handy visual aid here, we can take a look at some of the basic concepts involved in cross-country flying. Suppose you want to pilot this boat across a river to this dock. If you try to go straight, you'll end up downstream because of the current that's coming from this direction. So what do you need to do to get the boat to the dock? I need to turn into the current. That's right, but let's think about the ways that you can do this. If you keep pointing the nose of the boat toward the dock, you'll end up traveling in an arc like this, which is pretty inefficient. Or you can point the nose into the current at an angle, and you'll travel in a straight line like this. The key is trying to figure out which angle to use. So this is essentially the same thing that happens to the airplane in wind during a cross country. Right, and we use a flight computer to figure out what wind correction angle to use. You can use a mechanical flight computer like this one, or an electronic flight computer. One of the advantages of this type of computer is that you can visualize where the wind is coming from and how it affects your flight path. Looks like our time's almost up. Yeah, I think we're done for today. Now that we've covered cross-country planning, you need to finish getting ready for your knowledge test. Have you gone over those lessons on that test prep software? Yeah. In fact, the cross-country planning is the only part I haven't done yet, so I should be ready to schedule my computer test soon. That's good. Um, I'd like to do one more ground school session to review the planning before we schedule the dual cross-country. Oh, I was hoping we could do the cross-country on Monday. I think I'm ready. Yeah, you're close. Um, I'd like you to go over these practice problems, and then we can talk about them. 
We went over a lot of things today, and I'd like to give you some time to absorb all this information. You get so much more out of the cross country if you're completely comfortable and you don't have any questions. Okay. After we take a look at your work on the practice problems, then we'll go ahead and set up the flight. All right. Well, I have to go. I have another lesson. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and then work on some of these practice problems. See you next week. Okay. See you then. Well, I'm worried about doing a power on stall. A friend of mine told me you can go into a spin on a stall. As long as you keep the airplane coordinated with the rudder, just like a power off stall, you won't have any problem. You want something to drink? No, thank you. Let's go sit down and talk about how to recover if the airplane does start to spin. All right. I was terrified of stalls since my first instructor was always nervous when we had to do them. Mark's confidence really helped me understand what was going on, and I felt much better. These pretzels are making me thirsty. I'm going to grab a drink. Now, what did I say we were going to cover today? GPS approaches. Oops. I forgot to bring the handouts I was going to give you today. Maybe we better go over the ILS instead. Well, we've already covered that. Well, I guess it doesn't make you happy. If I were Rick, I'd get another instructor. Hey, Trevor. You didn't read what I told you, did you? You don't know any of this material. Only had one night and you assigned three sections. I couldn't get through it all. You know what? You learn a lot more if you read what I assign. You got something to say? I'm sure glad James isn't my instructor. I'd be too upset to learn anything. I'd better go back and study. Examining your cross-country planning session reveals how the proper use of instructional aids benefited both you and Mark. So, did you get a chance to watch that cross-country planning video? Yeah. I had no idea there's so much... Your lesson actually began before you met with Mark. The video he assigned helped introduce you to the subject of cross-country flight. Video is just one of the many instructional aids that can supplement and enhance an instructor's presentation of material, either in or out of the classroom environment. Studies show measurable improvement in student retention of information occurs when instructional aids are used in conjunction with a presentation. Instructional aids include such items as chalk or marker boards, supplemental print material, enhanced training materials, projected material, video, DVD, and computer-based multimedia, as well as models, mock-ups, and cutaways. Instructional aids used in the teaching process should be compatible with the desired learning outcome. To determine if and what instructional aids were necessary for this lesson on cross-country planning, Mark had to clearly establish the lesson objectives, being certain what must be communicated. For example, he had two primary goals in mind when preparing for this lesson. For you to understand the concepts behind the various aspects of cross-country planning, and for you to be able to perform all the operations necessary to properly plan a flight. Instructional aids are often used to emphasize key points and increase retention of material. In addition to video, Mark used several other types of support materials as part of your lesson. The boat model and marker board definitely made an impression that will help you remember the concept of wind drift correction. While the model boat was used as a prop to add some interest to this lesson, other more elaborate models, mock-ups, and cutaways can be used effectively to explain the operating principles of the equipment they symbolize. Before you worked a weight and balance problem, Mark explained the concepts behind weight and balance using supplemental print material. In addition to photos, charts, diagrams, and graphs, supplemental print material can include items such as study guides, exercise books, course outlines, and syllabi. A syllabus is also an example of enhanced training material. This type of material helps keep track of student progress, outlines the tasks students are to perform, and includes the standards they must meet. Throughout your training with Mark, you've encountered a wide variety of instructional aids, including test preparation material and computer-based multimedia. 
In fact, the software you're using to prepare for your knowledge test is an example of both of these aids. By assigning test preparation materials, whether in video, DVD, computer-based, or print format, Mark is relieved of having to directly supervise as you study for your exam. This allows him to focus on the application of concepts. Although you're a well-prepared student who shows up on time and is eager to learn, you're not immune to experiencing some of the obstacles to learning. Oh, I was hoping we could do the cross-country on Monday. I think I'm ready. Yeah, you're close. Um, I'd like you to go over these practice problems, and then we can talk about them. We went over a lot of things today, and I'd like to give you some time to absorb all this information. You get... Your impatience to schedule your first cross-country before you were fully prepared could be a greater deterrent to learning than you realize. Fortunately, Mark helped you understand what you need to accomplish to progress to the next stage of your training, and he clearly stated the goals you must meet. In addition to experiencing impatience, your own obstacle to learning, you also witness the difficulties of other students and instructors. Well, I'm worried about doing a power on stall. A friend of mine told me you can go into a spin on a stall. Anxiety is affecting Carla's ability to learn from her own perceptions and form the proper insights. She perceives stalls as dangerous, so it is up to Liz to provide an atmosphere that allows Carla to feel comfortable and confident about her lessons. As long as you keep the airplane coordinated with the rudder, just like a power off stall, you won't have any problem. You want something to drink? No, thank you. Let's go sit down and talk about how to recover if the airplane does start to spin. Now, what did I say we were going to cover today? GPS approaches. Oops. I forgot to bring the handouts I was going to give you today. Maybe we better go over the ILS instead. Well, we have already covered that. Well, I guess it doesn't make you happy. Rick is apathetic about his training because George is seldom prepared for lessons. You didn't read what I told you, did you? You don't know any of this material. Only had one night and you assigned three sessions. You couldn't get through it all. The exchange between James and Trevor illustrates two more obstacles to learning. Although Trevor is determined to fly, his motivation has suffered immensely due to James's unreasonable demands for progress and performance. James's unfair treatment also has caused Trevor to become upset, further deteriorating his ability to learn. Whether they relate to the amount of study material assigned or to a student's performance during a lesson, objectives and completion standards should be challenging but attainable. Students should thoroughly understand the objectives of each step of their training, how well they are progressing, and what deficiencies need to be corrected. Next week is soon upon you. After another helpful ground session reviewing the practice cross-country problems, you're ready for the dual cross-country. Notice to tell you about, we'd appreciate any pilot reports on FlightWatch 122.0. Thanks for your help. Hey, how's it look? Good VFR, with light winds on the surface and aloft. It looks like a perfect day. Great. And before you finish up your flight planning, I'd like to just quickly review what we're trying to accomplish on this cross country. I've listed everything that we're going to cover during this lesson and the performance I'm looking for. It looks like a lot. It is, but for the most part, you're using skills that you already have, like VOR navigation to fly the cross country. Plus, we'll stop and take a break down in Pueblo and regroup, answer any questions you might have, and go over the rest of the flight. Since you did so well with the dead reckoning on the way down here, I'd like to change our course a little on the way back and navigate just using VORs. Sounds good. So we'll be tracking Victor Airways back to Centennial? Yeah, exactly. Why don't we go grab a sandwich and talk about it? Hey, cross countries give you a great idea of what fun you can have with a pilot certificate. Yeah. There are so many places I'd love to fly once I pass my check ride, and I can't wait to take my family with me. Sounds good. Where do you plan on going? Oh, I think we'll probably go down to Orlando. You did very well today. Thanks. 
Let's start at the beginning and go over each phase of the flight so we can discuss some things you did right and some areas you need to improve upon for when you do your solo cross country. Um, I'd also like to hear how you think you did on certain things and if you have any questions. Okay, sounds good. Here's where we are on the syllabus. Once you finish the dual cross country, you'll do your solo cross countries and then we'll get you ready for your check ride. So I have to fly to the standards in the PTS for my check ride, right? That's right, but you've performed to those standards on all the maneuvers up to this point, so you'll be okay. And plus, all the lessons leading up to your check ride will allow you to review everything that we've covered. That will ensure that your performance is consistent and that you feel confident. Um, other than the flight lessons, we'll schedule a couple ground lessons and go over everything that we've covered in your training. And then we'll go over anything that you may miss on your knowledge test. I'm scheduled to take it next week. That's great. Um, one more thing before your check ride. Um, you'll do a final face check with Brad. He's one of our chief instructors here. Okay. Great. You've completed a course of training when you pass your private pilot check ride. A course of training is a complete series of studies leading to attainment of a specific goal, like a pilot certificate. A related term, curriculum, is a set of courses in an area of specialization offered by an educational institution. A training course outline, TCO, within a curriculum establishes the content of a particular course. The TCO normally includes statements of objectives, descriptions of teaching aids, definitions of evaluating criteria, and indications of desired outcomes. When you first began pilot instruction, Mark established a goal for your training. To help achieve this goal, he referred to a syllabus and other training materials to create objectives and completion standards for individual lessons. After determining the objectives and completion standards, Mark identified the blocks of learning that constitute the necessary parts of the total objective. The use of the building block concept allows students to master portions of the overall pilot performance requirements individually and then combine these with other related segments. For example, learning to get a briefing for local flights from flight service early in training made it easy for you to adapt this skill to obtain weather information for a cross-country flight. To make sure training is accomplished in a logical sequence and that all requirements are completed and properly documented, Mark used a syllabus. To be effective, a training syllabus should contain blocks of learning that should be completed in the most efficient order. A good syllabus should define the unit of training, describe the objective the student is expected to accomplish, show an organized plan for instruction, and provide for regular evaluations at prescribed stages. Each lesson in a training syllabus should include at least three main elements, objectives, content, and completion standards. Mark used these elements when he encouraged you to refer to the syllabus to help keep track of your progress and to let you know what to expect next. He also understood that a syllabus must be flexible and when necessary, he altered the course of training to suit your progress and the demands of special circumstances. Here's where we are on the syllabus. Once you finish the dual cross country, you'll do your solo cross countries and then we'll get you ready for your check ride. Mark uses a commercially published syllabus in conjunction with lesson plans that he develops on his own. A lesson plan is an organized outline for a single instructional period. The format of lesson plans can vary as long as objectives, content to support those objectives, and the completion standards are included. A well-designed lesson plan contains new material that is related to previous lessons. It should provide a foundation for organizing explanations and demonstrations to help students achieve the desired learning outcomes, as well as be reasonable in scope and length. Lessons also must be flexible to accommodate changing circumstances, such as weather or a student's performance. Since you did so well with the dead reckoning on the way down here, I'd like to change our course a little on the way back and navigate just using VORs. Lessons should be planned and executed with a positive approach in mind. 
Mark knows that emphasizing the positive aspects of aviation helps students have a more enjoyable training experience. And cross countries give you a great idea of what fun you can have with a pilot certificate. In addition, when students are able to see the benefits or purpose of a lesson, they will be more motivated. And plus, all the lessons leading up to your check ride will allow you to review everything that we've covered. That will ensure that your performance is consistent and that you feel confident. You did very well today. Thanks. Let's start at the beginning. Mark planned to critique your performance by following the sequence of events that occurred during the lesson. Mark understands that for his critiques to be effective, they typically exhibit certain characteristics, such as being organized. In addition, critiques should be objective, comprehensive, constructive, specific, and acceptable to the student. Mark also is thoughtful of his students' feelings, and his critiques are flexible enough to adapt to the requirements of the moment. For example, it can be counterproductive to belabor minor errors when a student is already upset with poor performance. In addition to providing critiques, Mark must also evaluate your performance. Critiques are used to summarize and complete lessons, as well as to prepare for the next lesson. Evaluations measure demonstrated performance against a criteria or standard. For example, Mark evaluated your performance today based on the objectives he established in the lesson plan. On top of observing your performance on particular tasks, Mark evaluated your understanding of topics by oral quizzing and written tests. Performance tests, such as the stage check you will be taking with Brad, evaluate training that involves an operation, procedure, or process. Flying with Brad not only assesses your skills, but also evaluates Mark's performance as an instructor. How well you do during this stage check can be a direct reflection on how well Mark has prepared you for your check ride. Speaking of your check ride, you'll be happy to know that you passed it with flying colors. You decide to attend the club party to celebrate. You've survived your trip back to the heady days of a student pilot. Along the way, you were able to experience several teaching methods from a student's perspective and then analyze their effectiveness. You were exposed to a wide variety of instructional aids that enhance learning. And you witnessed some obstacles to learning. You gained insight into the tools, such as syllabi and lesson plans, that instructors use to create lessons. And you got a look at the methods used by CFIs to critique and evaluate their students. The ability to place yourself in the position of a student should serve you well when you become an instructor. You'll have a greater understanding of the teaching methods that work and your students will benefit from your insight. Whether you call it cockpit or crew resource management, the objective of CRM is to increase pilot proficiency in the human factors aspects of aviation. Historically, the emphasis in pilot training has been to develop technical knowledge and flying skills. The belief was that flight crews would then integrate this information and training to arrive at correct decisions during flight operations. Today, we realize that teaching technical skills isn't enough and the aviation industry must also address the human element of flying. Skills involving effective communication, decision making, situational awareness, and workload management must play a significant role in training pilots and flight crews. The lack of these skills has had a tremendous impact on the number of aviation accidents. It's estimated that human factors contribute significantly to approximately 80% of all commercial and general aviation accidents. An increasing emphasis on CRM training is one way the aviation community is focusing on this issue. CRM has been an important element in Part 121 airline training for many years. Regulatory requirements will eventually mandate all air carriers, including most Part 135 operators, to provide CRM training to flight crews. CRM programs continue to expand in corporate flight departments as well as in the general aviation environment where human factors training is being implemented. 
CRM principles are even being applied to support groups, such as dispatchers, aviation maintenance technicians, and ground crews. United Airlines has one of the most extensive human factors training programs in the world. The ideas and techniques which are the foundation of this program are applicable to all areas of aviation, and an exploration of United's methods may lead to a better understanding of CRM concepts. An approach to flight training, which incorporates CRM, and programs which are tailored to specific flight environments may increase flight safety throughout the aviation community. The goal is to reduce the number of human factors related accidents. United Airlines is achieving this goal through their program called CLR, Command, Leadership, Resource Management. Why, why, why does the pilot land at the wrong airport? And the airplane's working fine. Um, well, what goes on? I mean, that's human factors. And one day, things worked out. That error chain just worked out to where they had an accident or incident. From 1980 to 1990, I had 127 hull losses around the world. 95 of them were preventable. They're human factors accidents. To me, that's absolutely inexcusable. How can we prevent this from happening in the future? What can we do differently? Then it all gives us a much better understanding and knowledge to build on. The ultimate goal, that there be no human factors caused accidents at all. There was a lot of concern about accidents, and uh, United's uh, interest in, in crew resource management developed in the late 70s, along with uh, the interest of, uh, evidenced by the FAA and NASA, who was doing research on flight deck uh, human factors. We had an unfortunate accident in 1978 with a DC-8 on final approach to Portland, which ran out of fuel. When that occurred, it was very hard to, to explain and there were many human factors aspects in that accident therefore the company along with the union the airline pilots association and uh, outside consultants uh, developed a program to address the human factors aspects of effective cockpit interaction this program is called command leadership resource management and has been in effect at united airlines since 1981 CLR exists, and, and we consider it important, and obviously the industry considers it important now because it addresses safety. Now, historically, we train pilots, all airlines train pilots, with, on technical skills, mechanical skills. How well you shoot an approach was, was addressed with, uh, in a technical sense. And if something uh, needed improvement, more time was given in the simulator. More instruction was given. But what was addressed was technical skills. You know, prioritizing your task in the cockpit. Doing things in the right sequence. Doing things uh, in, in a more efficient manner. But always in a mechanical way. When it became obvious in 1978, and, and a few incidents prior to that, and I'm thinking of the Tenerife incident, incident with two 747s colliding, and I'm thinking of United Airlines Portland incident, DC-8, running out of fuel. What became obvious was that we had technically proficient pilots, but yet, in spite of that, something failed. Something failed that created disaster. Something failed that was not safe. It was determined that the failure was, was a crew failure. It was a human interaction failure. It, it involved skills that uh, aviation, uh, the aviation industry had not been addressing. CLR was developed here at United Airlines with the sole goal in mind of safety. We have put considerable effort into the development of operationally relevant material for our crews. We want them to have information which will be relevant to their operation, which will be understandable and which will be usable. We know that CLR creates two things that are important. Creates a common language 
so that when we're using the words and the phrases in CLR, everyone knows what we're talking about. For example, at United Airlines, if I say to you, I'm uncomfortable, we know that's a cue for us to start talking about further information. We also know that CLR creates with it certain operational expectations so that our crews know what's expected of them. And those expectations and the common language are incorporated into all of our courses. CLR it is, revolves around a, a core document, a core of nine elements. And those elements are, are uh, come under the headings, the general headings of command, leadership, and resource management. There are three elements under command, three under leadership, and three under resource management. Captain's authority is, uh, where we start with that, is the mandate through FARs. The captain, the pilot in command, is in charge of the overall safety of the flight. That includes the efficiency, how well things are done, as well as uh, what is done. Leadership skills will change throughout a flight. Uh, sometimes a captain needs to be possibly more controlling, um, absolutely decisive. And at other times, a, a good captain can display skills of delegating workload, delegating some authority. A, a good captain, a good leader is one who can oversee the whole picture and can manage well. The captain is the, 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 captain is the final authority. The captain will make the final decision. But he, he or she needs all the input he or she can get from the other crew members. We teach them in the CLR course to advocate, to inquire if they're uncomfortable, to speak up about something. If they, if they feel they have some information, to give it readily to the captain. This wasn't always the case prior to CLR. The captain's responsibility to solicit input, be sensitive to input, concerns, uh, knowledge that other crew members may have, uh, perhaps are reluctant to bring it out, but uh, to still get that information out. Some people have said that, uh, in response to the question, what is the captain's job? I say, well, the captain's job is to gather information and then act upon the information. And when I've heard people ask, what is the co-pilot's job or another crew member's job? In the same context, uh, the answer that comes back often is, well, the co-pilot's job is to provide information. And somewhere during that discussion, the question may be asked, well, then what makes a good co-pilot? A good co-pilot would be someone who provides the right information. And the best co-pilots would be the ones who provide the right information at the right time. One of the things that our pilots do, our captains do very well, is, is establish a good crew climate, saying that they're not perfect in the airplane. And if you see something that I'm not doing correctly, or that's not part of our standard operating procedure, then query me, ask me, talk to me. Open communication. One of the best ways to quell some of the stress and pressures we feel, I think, is to openly communicate it. I think a lot of pilots might tend to feel that to admit that they are succumbing to stress, feeling the pressures of stress. I think they may view that as a weakness. With CLR, we're trying to get the point across. It in no way is admitting to any weakness. In fact, not recognizing it, not letting the other pilots in on it would be a sign of weakness. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about stress or stress management is fatigue. And that fatigue may be a result of something that's happened at home prior to coming to the workplace. It may be something that occurs as a result of the day's activities or the entire trip sequence activities. This may be the fourth day of a four-day trip, and we've had a lot of weather irregularities. We've had passenger problems. Perhaps we had mechanical problems with the airplane. All of these things add up. Often there are times to address it. Often there are times to turn it around, and that may require the input, the assistance of another crew member. I, 
a major aspect of, of United's program was the development of CLR training in the loft. Loft is line-oriented flight training and, and is completed in the simulators. During this period, a, a crew member is briefed on, a, a, on an aspect of CLR, decision-making or communication or leadership or use of resources, something along that line. Then they fly a scenario that is line-oriented, where they fly from one city to the next in the simulator. And during this two-hour period, they're given scenarios which um, will uh, help them to practice CLR skills. At the conclusion of the simulator session, there is the opportunity to view this videotaped session and discuss and critique what happened and learn the lessons as they see their own performance in the, uh, in the uh, cockpit. To teach the tools utilized in CLR, we, we specifically start academically by showing, by defining skills that we see, observable skills in CLR, and then showing videos and such, and we debrief the videos. We have the students debrief the videos and see what they see, and, and see it as an observable behavior, a physical behavior that can be recognized. After that, they go to the three-day seminar, and during the seminar, they interact with each other and set up in a cockpit environment with scenarios. They practice these skills. In the seminar, we, we take advantage of uh, situations that have truly happened out on, the, uh, out on the line, out on the line experience. We take it from line pilots. And by that, I mean people that are flying day to day, A to B. And they send in uh, certain situations. And we, we recreate them as uh, or we dramatize them sometimes in videos. We put them down on paper and uh, give them to the different students. Uh, and then we ask them to identify certain styles of operation in these particular situations. And actually, we ask them to play parts in certain cockpit experiments, and asking them to play the role of a particular style of operation. And then maybe we'll have one of the people in the, in the cockpit, we'll ask them to do what they would normally do without playing a role and uh, to solve or, or um, fix this particular situation and we've taken the situations from the line. People are in the seminar with their peers and their peers are encouraged to give direct, open, forthright, candid feedback on how people are operating, how their input is received by the rest of the group. and. Uh, Often we don't see ourselves accurately. We don't uh, picture ourselves operating as other people see us operating. The mirror we hold up to ourselves is, is not accurate. But when we get input from other people as to how we're coming across, that increased level of awareness, now, now we see how we're really uh, impacting flight operations, impacting what goes on in the cockpit. Some of the barriers to effective communication may come from the feeling that what you have to say, what you know, might not be correct. People are scared to speak up for fear they will look bad. Um, we find that with some new hires, and actually not just new hires, people when they're new on an airplane. You're now sitting next to a captain who has more experience than you on that piece of equipment. People tend to be reluctant to speak up for fear that they will look stupid. Um, people need to get over that fear and to understand they're thoroughly qualified and trained on the piece of equipment and that their input is vitally important. In our advanced airplanes with our glass cockpits, it's, it's a two-sided benefit and, and problem. The benefit is you have a lot of information, a lot of good information. The hard part is prioritizing that information and seeing what's relevant. The, the hard part about that is communication has to increase between the pilots because oftentimes, in this example, would be the A320, since it's fly-by-wire, when they control a stick, when the first officer moves a stick, the captain cannot feel it. And then you have to tell the other pilot. Since he doesn't know you're making a left-hand turn, if he doesn't think it's appropriate, he may think it's the airplane doing it by itself. 
is the automated systems. And so you say, well, I'm turning left, clear left, or whatever it may be. So the communication skills have to increase drastically. One type of incident that is still occurring today, and it's probably every pilot's wor worst nightmare. We're on a multi-engine airplane, and we have an engine failure. And we reach up during the procedure, and we shut down the good engine. This has happened for years and years. It happened 40 years ago, and it's still happening today. We've defined the wrong problem. And if there are two pilots in the cockpit, if there's one pilot in the cockpit, uh, defining the problem and defining it accurately is essential in solving the problem. One of the keys, I think, to problem definition when we speak about recognizing the problem, we need to recognize correctly what the problem is. And at times, people have assessed the situation and thought the problem was something else than it wasn't. I think a way to alleviate that is to make sure that all crew members aren't all focused on the one thing. That's how come when we deal with problems in emergencies, someone is always flying the airplane. Someone always is. The other person is concentrating on the problem. Well, you don't want the whole, all the crew members concentrating on one thing because then who is overseeing the entire picture? Someone needs to step back and continually watch the whole picture. When a problem exists, you need to take it as a single event or a far-reaching event. If you take it as a single event, the problem is that it, it may affect something else which you don't want to occur. So when you look at a problem, you define it. You take, if it's an immediate action, a fire or such, you take care of the problem immediately so that it doesn't do on jeopardy, undue jeopardy to the airplane. And then after that, you discuss it and find how, how does this affect me in landing safely and, and where should we be going to land at this point. We have role-playing exercises we use in some of our courses where the captain is faced or the pilot playing the captain's role is faced with the dilemma. Uh, it can be something uh, which is quite, requires urgent uh, decision making, uh, timely action to be taken. It may be something where time and risk are at a much lower level, much less urgency. But there's always a critique of what that pilot has decided to do uh, and how they've arrived at uh, having made a decision. The decision-making process is critiqued. The action taken is critiqued. And pilots don't like to ask for a lot of help. And I ask a specific question about fighter pilots. And these are usually one-person aircraft. And I ask them to raise their hands and tell me, is, uh, how can CLR, could it possibly be used in, in a one-person cockpit? How could that be? And a lot of them will say, no, it really can't be. So then I'll ask them about a situation on a go-around or a missed approach. How many people have actually landed when they should have gone around in a fighter plane or a single seater or just a small general aviation? And what caused them to land when they knew inside and in their heart that they should go around? And it's usually pride. It's usually thinking about what their, their other people on the aircraft carrier are going to think about them for going around or the other pilots on the ground. and in, in a military situation or just general aviation. There's a lot of pride involved. We do things for that very reason as pilots. And this course teaches you, or at least strives to teach you, that that's not the right thing to do. We continually cover accidents because we all learn from accidents. We learn from our past. We learn from our experience. The accidents help us to recognize what the crews did or did not do, how effective were they in their problem solving, what can we do differently, what can we learn from this. In most accidents, it's the, the accident has not been caused by a single event. It's caused by a series of events. Uh, one, of, one example of a single event incident was United's Flight 232 in Sioux City, the DC-10 
had a single catastrophic failure. Contrast that to another incident where there may have been a very subtle failure that had gone unnoticed. But there were other clues that something was wrong. And the crew didn't pick up on those clues or didn't investigate them deeply enough to identify what had failed. And then something else happens. And it may not happen on the airplane. It may be a weather problem to where we're, we're now shooting an approach in marginal weather. But the component that failed on the airplane and had gone unnoticed by the crew was a component, an instrument, a system, something that you would really like to have working for you in a low visibility approach. So now you're shooting the approach or beginning to shoot the approach and something else goes wrong. And, and, and nothing else has been addressed along the way. It may turn out that having addressed any one of those little links in the error chain would have prevented the incident or accident from having occurred. We plan ahead, just like uh, anybody from a, the lightest plane Cessna driver uh, to a jumbo jet 47, 400 would do it. It relieves the workload for us a lot later. If we're going into Los Angeles, for example, the heavy weather, we know the workload's going to be up there. So anything we can do ahead of time, diversion airport, missed approach procedures, uh, maintenance uh, frequencies, we have everything ready available. We don't have to do that at the last minute, it's already done. It relieves the workload for us, makes it easier in the long run. And you can do that in just any phase of aviation, not just airliners. We know that the workload can be incredible. In normal operations, sometimes the workload is not as high. In an irregular situation or in an emergency situation, the workload can be overwhelming. And we'll see this in the simulator oftentimes when we, we saturate them, we give them a number of emergencies, and they have to work through them, work through the checklist, and come to a positive conclusion. The thing is, stop. I have too much. Take it one step at a time, whether you have to hold, if you have the fuel to hold, or, or take another course of action. I think situational awareness not only covers where the airplane is physically in space. I think situational awareness covers where we are as pilots in our duties in the cockpit, this task that we're trying to achieve from point A to B safely. We tend to focus on things. We tend to narrow our focus. We tend to uh, mishear or not hear items. Uh, we tend to miss cues and clues and input that's coming our way constantly. How we handle that uh, can be very instructional, very educational. Uh, better ways to handle that can be brought to our attention. We can learn to recognize when we start to focus in on things. And we may get into something where just by increased level of awareness, by any one member of the crew, uh, perhaps by the entire crew as a whole, could lead to a more effectively functioning crew. The Florida Everglades with uh, Flight 401, and uh, they were involved, all three pilots, in a, in a light bulb for the landing gear, rather than maybe one person flying the airplane, the other two working on the problem. This is a long time ago. This is pre-CLR also. And uh, they ended up crashing that great big jumbo jet and a lot of fatalities in that thing. That was situational awareness. Where were they? What were they doing? They were not aware of the situation. They were aware that they had a problem, but not the overall situation. Resource management means getting all the relevant information available to you, both from inside the cockpit and outside the cockpit. We teach the pilots uh, to use their resources uh, on a daily A to B situation where there's not really any problems. For example, a flight from Paris to Los Angeles, we are constantly updating our, our alternate weather, our winds ahead of time, pilot reports from aircraft that are ahead of us. We have special frequencies that we use. Uh, we can talk to our dispatch to, to, check, to check weather, to check just about anything we need to check along the route. I was just listening to a training tape about, uh, it was a general aviation pilot somewhere in the Northeast who uh, was not instrument rated, 
was in the clouds, completely disoriented. If the pilot had used no resources, had never keyed the mic, had never made his problem known, had never used any other resources, uh, probably would have crashed. The airplane would have been destroyed, lives would have been lost. But there was a tremendous amount of assistance that was given by not only ATC, but another commercial airline. There was the Delta flight crew. It was also giving uh, basically fly instruction, instruction to this individual. Keep the nose up. Pull back the power. Asking this individual questions such as, what is your airspeed right now? The pilot had no visual reference. If these other resources had not been used, the results very likely would have been disastrous. The pilot landed safely, airplane was not scratched, and nobody was hurt. I think there was a, a good outcome to this incident because of very effective use of resources. The number of resources to be used is, is, should always be addressed academically, first of all. What are your resources? You, you need to be made aware of that these are possible resources. Then we oftentimes, the, the first thing we will do is show a, a video of Flight 232, which is a crash into Sioux City, Iowa, and we ask, well, what resources did they use? And they go through air traffic control, they use individuals, they use their manuals, they use uh, emergency uh, support, which is our uh, systems area maintenance, SAM, and also our dispatch control. And not only that, they use passengers to evaluate what they had. Our passengers are business flyers that fly out thousands and thousands of miles, and they're very familiar with the sounds and sights in the back of an airplane. One of the best known examples of effective CLR is United Airlines Flight 232, which everyone knows about. That was a DC-10. It was United Airlines DC-10. It was a CLR-trained United Airlines DC-10 crew that handled that. The effective use of CLR contributed to the saving of many lives. There were lives lost, but the effective use of CLR helped save lives and bring that airplane down to the ground in as safe a manner as possible. United 232, this is Sam. Sam, United 232, we blew a number two engine and we've lost all hydraulics and we are only able to control our uh, level flight with the uh, with the uh, Edgar, uh, power setting. We have very little letter or elevator. The uh, United uh, 232, understand that uh, you lost number two engine totally, sir? Perfect. I think our, our CLR training that we had in our, uh, was very effective because it put all three of us in a loop, and I'm, I'm not excluding Dudley, I'm talking about now how we handle the airplane. All four of us were working together in our communications and so forth, but actually controlling the aircraft with the three of us, uh, the CLR gave us all talking at the same time, all planning what we're trying to do, all thinking out loud is basically what it amounted to. And I think that was a very important part of getting the airplane down as safely as we did. And I am thoroughly convinced that by having the training that we had in our CLR, it put us all in a situation where we, we felt our input was important. We feel we have a good record. Since 1978, we have not had a passenger fatality related to a human factors or caused by a human factors accident. Our last human factors were caused accident was in 1984. We know that's an enviable record, but we're very, very much aware that we need to continue to maintain vigilance we are aware of human factors incidents that happen. And as those incidents come up, we try to address them. We revise training, incorporate new methods and new information to make sure that we address those incidents. It's great to be a good stick, but it's better to be a safe pilot, effective and efficient. I think for the airlines, CRM has been extremely effective, and I think that can be as effective with general aviation. Once we've tailored it to general aviation, the concepts that you learn in CRM are just as applicable to general aviation. I've been an instructor for many years. I've been a crew member on a Learjet uh, in an air ambulance situation, and in both environments, I was able to apply what I've learned with CRM. I think that an instructor who may not be entirely sure about how those 
concepts apply to a general aviation type environment needs to go out and educate themselves. There's publications, there's programs that they can enroll in that will give them CRM training and once they've seen those concepts, I think it becomes obvious how extremely important they can be to general aviation and how they can help to prevent human factors accidents. I think most instructors approach CRM as simply cockpit organization, and yet there's so many more concepts that can be applied to GA. For instance, risk assessment, decision making, workload management, and a lot of other concepts that all go together on CRM. And I think it's also important, and something I definitely try to do with my students, is to start from day one with CRM training, not leave it until the very last thing I teach a student or maybe miss it altogether. I think also you can apply it to every student you have from private, instrument, commercial, multi-engine, ATP. Those concepts apply to every one of those students and should be taught to all of them, regardless of their level of training. I think as instructors, we need to start evaluating our students on an additional level. We often will critique on a technical side, but we leave out the CRM or human factor side of a lesson. For instance, I want to be able to evaluate students on situational awareness, risk assessment, did they use all their resources, etc. If I'm doing a lesson, for instance, on crosswind landings, in the lesson objective, certainly we'll discuss the technical aspects of landing the airplane, but I'm also going to give them a specific CRM concept to work on, for instance, situational awareness. So after the flight, I can evaluate them on their landing. How well did they land the airplane and so on. But I'm also going to discuss, were they aware of where they were in the pattern? Did they know that another airplane had cut them off in the pattern? In other words, the situational awareness. During the course of training with my students, I like to discuss the resources they have available to them, even when they're flying by themselves. For instance, they can always talk to ATC, flight service stations, maybe even maintenance personnel. Additionally, they also will always have the checklists, and the airplane manuals aboard the airplane during an emergency, they can use those to help them alleviate some of the workload. Another valuable resource a pilot has are their own skills and knowledge. One of the failings I have seen, though, as an instructor is a pilot may not know how to use all the equipment they have on their airplane. So the GPS, the Loran, perhaps the autopilot they have is worthless because they don't know how to use it. All of that equipment can be very helpful and alleviate the workload a pilot can experience during a flight, especially on an instrument flight, for instance. It's important, however, not to become over-reliant on the equipment and lose your situational awareness. As a general aviation pilot, you'll often have passengers with you. That can be a very valuable resource if you use it properly. For instance, during the passenger briefing, let them know that you're more than willing to listen to them if they hear an unusual sound, if they think there may be something wrong, or just to help you find traffic in the uh, pattern or as you're flying along. A passenger that is really familiar with flying and flies quite a bit can really be a valuable resource. Communication is one of the important concepts of CRM training. Without good communication, you're nowhere. So I think it's very important with my students that from the beginning of their training, I try to eliminate the intimidation factor that can break down good communication. I think instructors unknowingly can intimidate their students, and often do. The way I can get past this is to tell them from the beginning, if you're uncomfortable with something, or you think there might be something wrong, let me know right away. I'm more than willing to discuss it with you, and I'm human. I do make mistakes. Maybe I haven't even realized that there's something wrong. Many flights we do in general aviation, you do it with another pilot. You like to split expenses with them. You have friends that are pilots. So and even as an instructor with a student. What I teach my students is in their pre-flight briefing as a regular thing is to discuss with another pilot who's going to be doing what, who's uh, responsible for the radio communications, for instance, or the navigation, so that that coordination begins in the pre-flight briefing rather than during the flight. One thing I teach for effective crew environment, a technique I like to use, is that I play the co-pilot with my student. I'll have them give me a job to do. Uh, whether that be, you, I want you to use the radio today and do the communications. I'm really busy trying to get my approach set up, for instance. Or another really good way of using the crew coordination concept is to get two, for instance, instrument students together. They're both rated in the airplane. And I'll sit in the back. And I'll see how do they coordinate with one another. And then in the post-flight briefing, we can critique how that coordination went.
I like to introduce my students to the decision-making process by evaluating old NTSB accident reports. Certainly we can never know exactly why a pilot made this or that decision, but by looking at the chain of events that led up to it, we can make some suppositions that allow us to maybe get into the pilot's head a little bit and thereby introduce some of the decisions they made. I think a, I want to be cautious when I look through accident reports. I certainly don't want to scare my student by, with the downside of aviation, but it certainly is a part of aviation. And what we can do is present it in the light of we can learn from these old accidents and thereby hopefully prevent them in the future. One of the accident scenarios I like to evaluate with my students is one that I was aware of because it occurred at the airport I fly out of. A gentleman was flying up from Texas and ran out of fuel literally on short final and was killed and several passengers were also killed when he crashed the airplane. The chain of events that led up to this accident is something I like to discuss with a student. For instance, why did he overfly several airports on the way to the destination and not stop for fuel? He accepted from the tower and extended downwind rather than explaining to them, I'm low on fuel, I need to land. He must have been on fumes by the time he turned base to final, and yet again, he didn't say anything. Maybe he was too proud to admit, I made an, an error in my fuel management, or he was worried about the consequences of declaring an emergency. These are the kind of human factors accidents that are easily preventable using cockpit resource management training. During the course of training with a student, I like to have one lesson that deals with the overall CRM concepts. I can do this in an airplane or a simulator, but either way I want to give them a scenario that tests their ability to make decisions. For instance, I will give them in the pre-flight briefing specific weather at an airport. Then after they take off, I'll fail their number one VOR, which removes the glide slope, so they can't do the ILS when they get to that airport. Now they have to assess, how will that affect my flight? Can I still get to my destination? Shoot the VOR approach, go missed, go to another airport? Will I have enough fuel to do that? I also may throw another emergency in to test their ability to handle the workload and to prioritize what they need to do. Then during the post-flight briefing, we can discuss how did they decide to do that and why did they decide to do that? What was the motivating factor? Could they have made a better decision? Approximately 80% of all general aviation accidents are pilot error. How many accidents could we prevent with human factors training? It's time to follow the lead of the airlines and change the way we think about flight training. The first thing you'll notice when you begin flight training for your instructor certificate is the seating arrangement. Your instructor occupies the left seat and you will transition to the right seat. This is necessary because beginning student pilots start out in the left seat, so you'll need to be proficient from the right seat. During the transition, you'll notice some negative transfer from the well-ingrained habits formed from your earlier training. When starting the engine and performing the pre-takeoff check, you'll notice that the airplane was not designed for easy operation from the right seat. All of the flight instruments, most of the operating switches, and in some cases, the engine instruments are located on the left side of the airplane. In addition, the power controls require use of the left hand. These differences require the gradual formation of new habit patterns. Typically, you'll have a tendency to take off on the left side of the runway, since previous experience has reinforced the idea that the white line belongs slightly to the right of the pilot's normal position. On initial attempts, it's not unusual to have the left wheel on the edge of the runway before achieving liftoff. Your instructor will provide timely guidance as the transition progresses. After initial orientation, the task of attaining private and commercial pilot proficiency from the right seat is assigned. This means that the entire range of maneuvers and procedures, including basic instrument flight, must be performed to private or commercial practical test standards, PTS. Even if your proficiency level is high, this normally requires three to five hours of instruction and additional solo practice. 
Crosswind and specialty takeoffs and landings require the greatest effort and concentration. These procedures tend to accentuate the change in visual perspective between the left and right seats. It's best to proceed cautiously and gradually work up to the performance requirements that are specified in the appropriate PTS. Following the transition period, practice instruction periods will be assigned and the character of the CFI course should become evident. Your instructor will require you to formulate a lesson plan on a given maneuver or series of maneuvers. During the lesson, the instructor will imitate a typical student pilot whose proficiency level is appropriate to the stage of training assigned. You will be expected to explain the maneuver as the demonstration is performed with your student following through on the controls. Your student will then perform the maneuver while displaying various errors or faults in performance. You are expected to correct the student and criticize performance as the lesson progresses. Lesson assignments for the instructor course become progressively more involved, but they follow this general format. Your instructor will shift roles throughout the practice lessons, first acting as the student pilot, then reverting to the instructor role for a critique of your performance and progress. Through this procedure, you gradually learn to present a specific lesson complete with pre-flight and post-flight briefings. Your instructor will also emphasize the importance of exercising positive exchange of the flight controls as a safety measure. This is designed to reinforce the habits so you, in turn, will teach your students to always follow the procedure. There are many times when you need to exchange control of the airplane with your student. For example, after you demonstrate a maneuver, you need to pass control so that your student can also attempt it. When you do so, the FAA recommends a three-step procedure to ensure that it is clear who has control of the airplane at all times. First, you should say, you have the flight controls. You should continue to fly until your student acknowledges the exchange by saying, I have the flight controls. You should also check visually to establish that your student has taken control of the airplane, then say, you have the flight controls. Okay, you have the flight controls? Okay, I have the flight controls. You have the flight controls. Okay. If you should need to assume control of the airplane, take the controls firmly and state, I have the flight controls, visually checking to verify that your student has released the yoke. I have the flight controls. Hey, you have the flight controls? I have the flight controls. Remember that communication is key to safe instructional flights. I'm Mike Abbott, a flight instructor, and your host for this edition of Flightline, Teaching Flight Safety. As flight instructors, we often champion the safety of flight to our students, but when was the last time we stopped and asked ourselves, just how safe is flying? Or, a better question may be, is flying really as safe as it can be? Until recently, accident statistics indicated that flying was becoming safer. In fact, NTSB reports reflected a decrease in the general aviation accident rate from 1984 through 1990. However, in 1991, the accident rate began to rise and continued to increase through 1994, even as flight activity declined. More significant than the statistics are the events which led to the accidents. An investigation into the causes of accidents and incidents can enhance flight safety by helping us identify risks and recognize hazardous situations. This knowledge can be passed on to our students to prevent accidents in the future. To explore this idea, we'll profile three examples of general aviation accidents. After uncovering the circumstances surrounding each accident, we'll use the lessons we learned to formulate teaching methods that we can use to help our students avoid making the same mistakes.
pilots at Lakeford Airport rarely encounter much traffic or trouble, but on one hot July afternoon, this small uncontrolled field became the site of an unfortunate accident. A Cessna 172 crashed into trees during initial climb after departing runway 17. The pilot and one passenger suffered minor injuries, and two passengers were seriously injured. The airplane was destroyed. There was no evidence of prior damage to the airplane or of any equipment or structural failure prior to impact. The first step of my investigation was to track down information about the airport and runway environment. The field elevation of Lakeford Airport is 1,000 feet. Runway 1735 is a grass strip 2,100 feet in length with trees located at the departure end of runway 17. Next, I spoke to a pilot who witnessed the accident. Um, I remember thinking that the 172 was taking off in a slight tailwind. Um, it was only about five knots, uh, but it hadn't been steady coming from any one direction all afternoon, and that was a, it was a pretty hot day. How hot do you think it was that day? Well, see, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. It must have been 95 degrees. That's typical for July around here. I saw the airplane take off, and he just barely made it off the strip. He lifted off, like, right over there. I mean, he was almost in the weeds. Um, he was level in ground effects and just barely started to climb. I didn't think he was going to clear those trees. Sure enough, he didn't make it. It appears as if the 172's performance was insufficient to complete the takeoff roll on the available runway and clear the trees after departure. Although the pilot, Bob, refused to comment, I was fortunate to interview one of the passengers who was on board the airplane the day of the accident. Well, I, I recently moved to Lakeford. I had asked Bob to come visit me, so I took some friends out to the airport to meet him, and he offered to take us up over town. How many passengers were there? Uh, there was three of us plus Bob. Was there any baggage on board the airplane? Well, Bob was planning to stay overnight, so he had a suitcase and uh, his flight bag. How much would you estimate that the four of you plus that baggage weighed? Well, I'm about 165. Bob's the same. Uh, Gary is about 180. And Jim has to be about 200 pounds. Okay. The, the baggage couldn't have been over 25 pounds total. Do you remember if you had full fuel that day? Yeah, Bob had asked the guy to top the tanks off before we left. I calculated the airplane's weight and balance based on the information provided by the passenger. According to my figures, on the afternoon of the accident, the 172 was 35 pounds over the maximum takeoff weight limitation, and the center of gravity was located near the aft limit. Were you aware that the time of the flight, the airplane was 35 pounds overweight? No, I had no idea. Do you remember Bob performing any calculations prior to the flight? Did he get out the airplane flight manual? None that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't think he even knew we were going to go up until we're all out looking at the plane, and then Jim had asked him. The takeoff distance chart provided additional clues as to the cause of the accident. At a maximum weight of 2,400 pounds and a temperature of 95 degrees Fahrenheit, 35 degrees Celsius, I calculated the 172's ground roll to be approximately 1,625 feet. The total distance to clear a 50-foot obstacle equates to 2,809 feet. To arrive at these figures, I increased the distances by the percentages indicated in the performance chart notes for operation on a dry grass runway with a 5-knot tailwind. Was Bob's experience as a pilot a factor in his decision to fly that day? Logbook entries indicated that Bob had approximately 200 hours. A month before the accident, he completed a flight review at his local airport. But the majority of Bob's flights were in the local area, and he had never flown to Lakeford Airport before the day of the accident. Let's examine this all too common scenario. In a study of NTSB accident reports over a six year period, it was determined that pilot error and poor decision-making accounted for nearly 77 percent of all accidents. For example, numerous takeoff accidents involved attempting overgross takeoffs, failing to account for high temperature and density altitude effects, or failing to abort a takeoff. 
A lack of pilot understanding regarding operations with varying field conditions, runway lengths, and elevation and temperature effects was indicated as a cause in many of the accident reports. Let's examine how a combination of these factors played a part in Bob's accident and how we can teach our students to avoid these same errors. An overgross takeoff was attempted. Operating in excess of maximum certificated takeoff weight results in a longer takeoff roll, reduced climb performance, and an increase in stall speed. There was a failure to account for high temperature and density altitude effects. It's a mistake to assume that because terrain is relatively low, density altitude does not need to be considered. Regardless of the field elevation, an increase in density altitude still results in an increase in takeoff distance, a reduced rate of climb, an increase in true airspeed on approach and landing, and increased landing roll distance. These factors, combined with a short runway, can lead to disaster. Students should be taught to make a practice of calculating weight and balance in determining airplane performance during pre-flight preparation. In addition, it's essential that students learn to use the information obtained from performance charts and graphs effectively. For example, adding at least 50% to all takeoff and landing distances can account for pilot technique, underinflated tires, dragging brakes, weak engine, or any additional variables which may affect optimum performance. It's important for students to understand that data obtained from these charts is based on a properly tuned airplane in good condition with solid brakes and the assumption that the pilot has average piloting abilities. In addition, performance figures are based on a specific procedure, aircraft configuration, and airspeed. For example, takeoff distances are normally predicated on short field techniques, and maximum rate of climb charts are based on operation at a specific indicated airspeed. What led to this pilot's downfall? Attempting an overgross takeoff from a short grass runway on a hot day with a tailwind. Why would a pilot ignore all these factors which have such a tremendous effect on the safe outcome of the flight? The answer might lie in the pilot's past experience. Flights in familiar surroundings can become routine and complacency may set in. When faced with an unfamiliar environment, some pilots may not fully consider all the variables which affect the flight. As flight instructors, are we providing sufficient training to prepare our students for the wide variety of situations which may be encountered in future flights? A study of NTSB accident reports suggests that maybe we are not. A conclusion which can be drawn from many accidents which occur during instructional flights is that CFIs may fail to effectively teach aircraft operation in other than normal situations. Numerous accidents with both instructor and student on board involved operation during hot weather, short runway use, soft field use, operation in excessive gusts and crosswinds, improper fuel tank switching after a power loss, and loss of control following an inadvertent door opening. During training, we must expose our students to a wide variety of flying environments and abnormal situations. If it is not practical to operate at many different airports, we can present flight planning scenarios which involve a variety of field conditions, runway lengths, and varying flight conditions such as temperature and wind. We can also discuss accident reports such as the one we have just investigated to provide a vivid example of situations to avoid and the importance of making good decisions when presented with an unfamiliar environment. These ideas must also be reinforced during flight reviews and advanced training. Generally, accidents are not caused by just one, but a series of events. Although Bob made many poor decisions prior to takeoff, Another significant factor was Bob's failure to reject the takeoff as soon as it was clear insufficient runway remained and aircraft performance was inadequate. Pilots can easily develop the mindset that, once initiated, a takeoff or landing must be completed regardless of the circumstances. Go-arounds are often discussed and repeatedly practiced throughout flight training. However, a procedure that may be overlooked is the aborted takeoff. Students may feel committed to a takeoff once full power is applied and the airplane begins to accelerate. It should be clear to the student that an option to discontinue the takeoff always exists if a problem occurs. A check of the engine instruments to verify that the engine is developing full power and is operating within limits should be made during every takeoff. Slow acceleration or any hesitation of power is sufficient reason to reject the takeoff. If aircraft handling is difficult, loss of directional control occurs, or insufficient runway remains to complete the takeoff roll, students should be conditioned to discontinue the takeoff. 
Statistics indicate a lack of sufficient training regarding rejected takeoffs. The NTSB cited failure to abort a takeoff or a delayed abort in the causes of 229 accidents over a six-year period. For general aviation pilots operating at busy airports like this one, wake vortex encounters can be a very real concern and, as revealed in our next investigation, can lead to accidents. The pilot of a Piper Archer was on final approach for runway 33. The airplane crashed just short of the threshold, swerved to the northeast, and came to rest on the approach end of runway 36. The pilot suffered minor injuries, but the aircraft received substantial damage. I spoke to the pilot about what he experienced when the accident occurred. Well, it's an experience I won't soon forget. I was told to proceed direct to runway 33 and pass behind a Boeing that was on final to 36. When I was on final, the plane pitched, rolled violently to the right, and I added left rudder and full left aileron to try to get it level again. Well, I thought I was going to stall, so I nosed it down, and that was a mistake because that ground was rushing up so fast I pulled back hard, but by that time it was too late. After reviewing the airport diagram, I learned that the approach ends of runway 33 and 36 are approximately 560 feet apart. Radar data obtained from ATC indicated that the Archer was at an altitude of less than 100 feet AGL when it crossed path of a Boeing 757 on approach to runway 36. The 757 had passed the crossing position of the flight pass approximately 30 seconds prior to the Archer. Trends in the radar data indicated that the flight path of the Archer was slightly above the path of the 757 at the point of crossing. The details of this accident suggest that the Archer encountered the Boeing 757's wake vortex. But if the Archer was above the Boeing's flight path, how could this occur? To find the answer, it was necessary to take a closer look at wake vortices. The vortex is a mass of rotating air which consists of a core and a flow field about the core. The size and strength of the flow field determine the risk posed to the trailing airplane. Research indicates that the characteristics of wake vortices are more complicated than many pilots realize. In addition to the aircraft's weight, speed, and configuration, the strength of the wake vortex is dependent on wing shape and angle of attack. Atmospheric conditions also play a very important role in determining the strength of wake vortices. Atmospheric stability, winds, ground effect, and turbulence are significant factors often overlooked when discussing wake turbulence. For example, the movement of wake vortices near the ground has been observed to be quite complex. Wake vortices tend to remain in ground effect and spread outward at a speed of 3 to 5 knots plus the wind component. In the case of our profiled accident, the left vortex of the 757 typically would have extended 200 to 300 feet toward the west in ground effect. The vortex core may have been located approximately 75 feet above the ground, although research has indicated that a vortex has the potential to bounce twice as high as its steady state height. In addition, the diameter of the vortex's flow field is usually about equal to the generating airplane's wingspan. The archer could have been affected by the vortex between the ground and approximately 200 feet AGL. Although the archer was above the flight path of the 757, the pilot did not adequately compensate for the height of the wake vortex. Our students should be aware of the unique movement of wake vortices near the ground and that additional research is being conducted to learn more about these vortex characteristics. By remaining several hundred feet above the preceding airplane's flight path, wake vortices which may rise in ground effect can be avoided. In addition to vortex movement, the duration of wake vortices also is affected by atmospheric conditions. Small amounts of turbulence may significantly enhance wake vortex decay, while very low turbulence levels under certain atmospheric states can slow vortex dissipation. Even under unstable conditions, vortices can maintain high velocities for over 60 seconds. Once decay begins, vortices dissipate rapidly, but a vortex can retain almost 90% of its original strength up to 85% of its lifetime. Additional insight into the complexity of wake vortex movement 
can be gained by examining reports of wake turbulence encounters. Unfortunately, there's a lack of extensive data in the United States, since pilots aren't required to report wake vortex encounters. Some information is available from wake turbulence accident and incident reports filed through the Aviation Safety Reporting System, or ASRS. However, these reports may not be representative since they're voluntarily submitted and not all pilots and controllers may be aware of the ASRS or are equally willing to file reports. Despite the limitations of this data, the reports do suggest that pilots are continuing to encounter wake vortices at an unacceptable rate. Many pilots involved in accidents had been given wake vortex precautions by ATC yet took no action, either ignoring the warning or mistakenly believing that their flight path was above the vortex. While ATC is required to apply a specified minimum separation for aircraft operating behind heavy jets and certain large aircraft types, it is ultimately the pilot's responsibility to visualize and avoid vortices and VFR conditions. Airplane separation distances for wake vortex avoidance are based solely on weight, although other design features can affect the vortex formation. For example, Boeing 757 flaps are continuous from the fuselage to the ailerons, a design which researchers believe is more conducive to uniform development of the wake vortex. Research is continuing on wake vortex generation and methods pilots and air traffic controllers can use to enhance avoidance procedures. For example, the development of techniques which pilots can use to determine relative flight paths and separation distances is being explored. During certification, Determination of an airplane's wake vortex characteristics by flight test or other suitable means is another step to improve safety. To assist in further research involving the hazards of wake turbulence, we can submit and encourage our students to submit ASRS reports providing details of any wake turbulence encounter. Wake turbulence avoidance should be a part of all levels of training, including instrument instruction and flight reviews. Many of the pilots involved in wake vortex accidents had instrument ratings. The private pilot and commercial pilot practical test standards include wake turbulence avoidance as an objective under the task of traffic patterns. Also, the PTS introductory material directs examiners to place emphasis on those aircraft operations most critical to flight safety, including wake turbulence avoidance. In addition to ground discussions, we should set an example for our students by always following wake turbulence avoidance procedures. How important are written checklists to flight safety? Our next accident profile may provide an answer to this question. During initial climb, a Cessna 152 stalled and crashed approximately 500 yards from the departure end of runway 10. The airplane was destroyed and both occupants were killed. Investigators found that the flap indicator was set at 30 degrees and the airplane's flap surfaces were at 30 degrees on impact. No pre-impact defects or failures were discovered. To learn more about the cause of the accident, I spoke to a flight instructor who witnessed the crash. Well, as you know, it was a 152 on takeoff, and uh, it appeared that the 152 had full flaps down. And as you can see off the departure end of the runway here, the terrain starts to rise you know, quite rapidly. Well, the aircraft started on the takeoff roll and got up into ground effect and established a pretty high you know, nose attitude and looked like it just was unable to um, climb out of the ground effect. Well, it got near the end of the runway and uh, appeared to enter a slight left turn to avoid the rising terrain, and the nose just broke down and pitched down violently, and it, the aircraft uh, struck the ground. Would there be any reason to take off with full flaps extended? Not in a 152, no. And in fact, the uh, manual specifically states that uh, full flap takeoffs are not approved. Based on your experience as an instructor, why do you think the pilot attempted to take off with full flaps? Well, I don't think the pilot intentionally tried to take off with uh, full flaps. I think it was probably more of a, uh, a mistake. Uh, they were left down after the pre-flight. Um, probably was in a bit of a hurry uh, during the takeoff and during his uh, run-up and you know, maybe inadvertently missed that step on his, uh, on his checklist. I checked the airplane flight manual and found that two checklists to be followed prior to a normal takeoff indicate that flaps should be set at zero or 10 degrees. In addition, the short field takeoff checklist indicates a 10 degree flap deflection. How common are accidents caused by either disuse or misuse of checklists? According to NTSB records, 
During a four and a half year period from 1988 through 1993, there were 87 accidents in which checklist problems were specifically attributed as a cause or factor. 43 accidents occurred during the approach and landing phase of flight, while 35 occurred during takeoff. Landing gear was indicated in 36 accidents, fuel systems in 28, and flaps were involved in 11 of the reports. The most serious accidents involving misuse of checklists occurred when flaps were improperly configured, usually during takeoff. Pilots admitted that checklists were not used at all in 33 of the 87 accidents, while in most of the others, portions of the checklists were either skipped or forgotten. In 44 cases, a distraction drew the pilot's attention away from the problem which caused the accident. Checklist disuse or misuse may be far more widespread than this data indicates. Although checklist problems were specifically cited in these reports, accidents which were attributed to other causes may have involved some failure to properly use checklists. Accidents with reported causes such as carburetor heat, emergency procedures, fuel tank selector position, or gear extension may have been prevented by proper use of checklists. We should set an example for our students by using checklists throughout all phases of training. This can be especially important during advanced instruction. As proficiency is gained, some pilots may feel that checklists are no longer necessary. In fact, the exact opposite may be true. As experience is gained, pilots typically fly increasingly complex airplanes and operating procedures become more extensive. In addition, the tendency to fall back on old habit patterns or become complacent can be hazardous for high time pilots operating a wide variety of airplanes. The fact that checklists are not used for all phases of flight is one of the most common safety problems involving checklist misuse. Typically, pilots may stop referring to the pre-flight, cruise, and approach portions of the checklist first, followed by the before landing and after landing checklists. Many pilots feel that it is sufficient to have checklist items memorized. These individuals can cite the hundreds of incident-free hours which they have flown without using the written checklists. We can remind our students that most checklist accidents involve some form of distraction or disruption of normal flight routine. When a distraction occurs while using a written checklist, it is easy to resume the checklist by starting with the last item completed. A mental checklist only makes it more likely that an item will be forgotten after a disruption of flight routine occurs. In some cases, it takes only one forgotten item to lead to an accident. Some emergency procedures require the checklist or a portion of it to be memorized. In some situations, the use of the checklist while accomplishing the procedure would be unsafe or unfeasible, especially in single pilot operations. In these cases, the checklist should be reviewed after the procedure has been performed to ensure that all items were accomplished. The additional stress of an emergency situation can lead to a critical item being overlooked. The FAA emphasizes written checklist use, and during practical tests, applicants are evaluated on the use of the prescribed aircraft checklists. The importance of following written checklists is graphically illustrated by three air carrier accidents, which resulted in part from the crew's failure to properly deploy flaps prior to takeoff. The accidents resulted in multiple fatalities, and the aircraft were destroyed. These tragic accidents serve as a reminder of how important our role is in teaching flight safety. The habits and attitudes our students develop today may shape the future of aviation. And although flying may never be 100% safe, we should do our part to help increase the odds. list of what we need to cover. Okay, now does anybody remember the procedures that we've covered? Um, I think we've covered ILS and I think we remember VOR. Um, I guess that means we have MDB left. Um, let me see. Oh, and we probably ought to cover radar. Um, do any of you know if that's right? Um, should we continue with NDB approaches or 
Bob, do you remember what we've covered? Actually, it's Rick. My notes show we've covered ILS, VOR, and NDB. But Professor, you were extremely vague and mentioned that you would come back to each approach and discuss them more thoroughly. Did I say that? I could have sworn we covered that in depth, but, well, maybe that was another class, who knows. So, um, okay, um, I guess, I guess we will get started on radar if that's where you say we are. The role of the flight instructor continues to expand, and along with it comes an increased responsibility to students and the general flying public. To meet these responsibilities, professionalism has become a necessary prerequisite for the successful instructor. This CFI renewal program defines some of the qualities of the professional instructor and provides other information of practical value to the beginning as well as the experienced flight instructor. This edition will join Rick Castorina, a student and a flight instructor, as he progresses through a normal day. What you just viewed is the beginning of a typical day for Rick. He is enrolled in an instrument instructor ground school. This ground school is designed to educate the student on the information necessary to become an instrument instructor, as well as to provide additional tools needed to become effective crew members and better instructors. As you have seen, Rick and his classmates are frustrated with the lack of professionalism and organization exhibited by their professor. Throughout this program, you will see many of the environments a flight instructor must face in a typical day and the importance of maintaining a professional attitude in each and every interaction. You will also see tips on improving teaching techniques and receive a review of regulatory requirements and authorizations needed to recommend an applicant for a practical test. Let's rejoin Rick and his classmates at the conclusion of their ground school. Let's see now. We finished covering approaches. So does anybody have any questions? Okay, good. If you haven't noticed, we're coming towards the end of the semester, and that means final examinations. And I think you all ought to be studying for those. Now, um, you should plan on studying everything we've covered in class, as well as everything from your reading assignments. My finals are comprehensive and essay. So um, for the next class, I'd like you to write a five-page paper on your understanding of IFR approaches, okay? And I think I'll give a quiz. I'm not sure what it's going to cover. But uh, why don't you just review all your notes for the last couple of weeks? Well, that should do it. Um, see you next time. Dan, we are in trouble if this class is supposed to be teaching us how to become instrument instructors. Yeah, I know it, Rick. We're not only supposed to be learning the information necessary for our check ride, but I thought we'd learn more than just enough to take the test. We've got to become better instructors, to expand our overall knowledge, things like that. We aren't getting any of the information we need. All we're getting is a bunch of information dumped on us, and we're expected to know it for the test. So far, everything I've done to prepare for my check ride has been on my own. I haven't learned a thing. What a way to teach. Actually, it's no way to teach at all. Do you remember our professor when we were getting our initial CFIs? He was constantly emphasizing professionalism and teaching to a higher level. Sure, that's one of the best professors I ever had. He taught us first to establish goals with our students, then define the objectives to obtain those goals, and he emphasized the importance of assessing and evaluating our students' needs. Yeah. He also taught us how to perform a comprehensive evaluation instead of this memorize and take the test method. Remember how he explained the continuous process of measuring, judging, and deciding? And he encouraged us to determine why our students pass or fail so we could learn how to better present a subject. You know, more often than not, when a student passes something, the instructor simply moves on to the next subject. And then, when the student fails, you just keep teaching it over and over again until the student finally passes. I hope my students feel that I teach and evaluate in a logical and methodical format. I really try to tailor how I teach a subject to fit their personal learning style. You and me both. I don't want to be anything like this professor who ignores learning styles and everything else that has to do with effective teaching. I agree. 
The classroom environment that you just viewed exhibits a teaching environment with a lack of planning and minimal effectiveness on the part of the instructor. The professor portrays a very casual attitude towards teaching with very little planning and preparation. Not only is organization and effective teaching a key factor in exhibiting a high level of professionalism, but there are several other aspects that are equally important. Such aspects include proper attire, a positive attitude, an overall professional appearance, and the ability to communicate effectively. Subtle actions, such as maintaining control of the classroom, always having a lesson plan prepared, and building positive relationships with students all aid in enhancing the professional instructor. In the case of the Instrument Instructor Ground School, there were numerous elements that were missing that would have made this teaching environment more effective. For example, the instructor should be reminded of the four basic steps that make up the teaching process. This process has been found to be essential to effective instruction. These basic steps include preparation, presentation, application, review, and evaluation. Whenever you are preparing for classroom or in-flight instruction, it is necessary to prepare a lesson plan. The lesson plan is simply a statement of the lesson objectives the specific goals to be attained, the procedures and facilities to be used, and the means of evaluating the desired results. The critical point in the lesson plan is the determination of the objective. Once a lesson plan is developed, the instructor or professor is then responsible for introducing the student or class to the subject to be covered during the lesson. After the information has been presented, the student is prompted to apply the new information. During the application step, a student is guided into the development of insights, recitation, and problem solving. Depending on the specific subject matter, portions of the instructor's demonstration and explanatory activity can be alternated with portions of the student's trial and practice activity, although they are technically separate segments of the lesson. For example, during a lecture, a professor will explain a concept and then open the discussion up to questions from the students for further clarification regarding the concept presented. Before concluding an instruction period, it is important that the instructor summarize what has been covered during the lesson and ensure that the objectives set out have been obtained. Prior to student evaluation, the instructor must also verify that all information that will be asked during an exam has been covered with the student. Let's rejoin Rick as he continues with his day. Rick, thanks for taking the time to explain to me what we are going to do in our lesson today and what you expect of me. My last instructor was always so frazzled. He never could remember what we had done in the previous lesson, much less prepare me for what we do in the current lesson. He was so disorganized. You know, Karen, one of my classmates and I were just discussing this. I'm really surprised at the number of instructors who don't understand how to teach more effectively. Well, I've just had a couple of instructors, but it seems a typical flight instructor gives you a brief ground explanation, then demonstrates the procedure, and then if you're lucky, they let you actually fly the procedure. And if you have trouble with the procedure, the instructor again demonstrates it, and then has you try it. Eventually, you learn something through trial and error. It's incredibly frustrating, certainly not the most effective method. You're right, it's not very effective at all. It seems that the best instructors do more than just teach by the numbers. They participate in the learning process by actively guiding their students. They have a very positive attitude towards learning. They encourage their students to learn as much as they can, not just enough to pass the test. They thoroughly explain concepts, procedures, and techniques. They take the time to understand their students so they can determine the best method of instruction. It makes a big difference. I couldn't agree more. Okay, I think we better get on with the lesson now. As we discussed, we're going to practice landings today, Karen. Okay. Do you remember the last time we did landings? Our goal was to land the airplane within five feet of a designated touchdown spot. As I recall, we had about 10 knots of wind that day. Well, it looks like we've got about 10 knots of wind again today, so we're going to be able to compare to that of your last lesson. Do you have any questions? No, I don't. Let's get going. OK. It is important for the instructor to let students know what will occur as well as why it will occur. Additionally, once the student is in flight, they are concentrating on flying and typically they are not giving you their full attention. 
Therefore, when you are discussing a task or explaining part of a lesson, wait until the student is flying straight and level so they can pay more attention to you. In some cases, this may not be possible because the student is overwhelmed with the situation. If this occurs, fly the airplane yourself and then proceed with your explanation. As your student's proficiency increases, allow them to fly in more demanding situations. Throughout all phases of flight training, as a flight instructor, you must always keep in mind that your students view you as a role model and you have a tremendous influence over their attitude towards aviation. You will notice your students will accept and adopt your attitude and approach to flying. When they are impressed by something you do in the cockpit, they will learn it and eventually use it, regardless of whether or not it's in your lesson plan. If you do something that your student isn't ready for, explain the dangers and applicability of that situation. Make sure they know when and how to use their newly acquired knowledge. Let's return now to see how Rick ends his flight lesson with Karen. Karen, today's flight was excellent. Thanks. I can see you really understand what you're doing and you make all the necessary corrections while on final. I see definite improvement over the last lesson. Well, it's all starting to come together. I know what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. Good. Let's go inside and debrief and talk about what we're going to do next. Okay. Okay, Karen, do you have any questions about what we did today or anything that we've discussed? No, I sure don't. I know what I need to prepare for, so I guess I'll see you next week. Sounds good. Listen, if you've got any questions between now and then, don't hesitate to give me a call. I won't. See you later. Okay. Hey, Rick, got a minute? Hi, Ron. Sure, sit down. What's Thanks. up? I have a student who's really struggling with landings. I've tried to demonstrate them, talk him through them, and even explain them over and over. I feel I've tried everything, and well, basically he's frustrated, and so am I. Well, Rhonda, sometimes if a student can't grasp a particular maneuver or concept, it may help if another instructor flies with a student and practices the same maneuver. And if that doesn't work, you may want to question the student to see if there's anything inhibiting his ability to learn. What type of things are you talking about? An example can be poor eyesight or a lack of reading comprehension skills, or your student may even be having trouble with depth perception. I never thought about vision problems. If none of those things work, let me know. And if you'd like, I'll fly with him. Keep me posted. Alex, if you want your students to use more of what they learn, then you're going to have to begin teaching at a higher learning level. What do you mean by teaching at a higher level? Avoid asking questions that require only memorized answers. Instead, ask questions that require students to explain what they're doing. Do you mean to say that when I'm teaching a student how to recover from an unusual attitude, instead of just asking them how they should recover, I could ask them to explain what each instrument is telling them and what response they would take based on the information from all the instruments? That would be a good approach. That way students are describing in their own words what they must do. This gives more meaning to the concept, knowledge, and skills associated with the maneuver and establishes relevance. I guess students need to be taught to think, analyze, evaluate, and explore, and not just study and memorize to pass the test. By teaching them at a higher level of learning and encouraging them to think more critically, they will become safer pilots because they understand the concepts behind the answers. That makes a lot of sense. I think I'm going to begin using these ideas in my lesson plans. Alex, I can guarantee you that you'll have more informed students and you'll have a better understanding of what you're teaching as well. You know, we ought to get on with the lesson so we can complete our objectives for the day. Just as Rick was explaining to Alex, teaching on a higher plane leads to understanding and gives more meaning to learned activities. If you want your students to be able to apply more of what they learn, teaching at a higher learning level is a necessity. These thought processes require a complete understanding of basic concepts and knowledge, and working at these upper levels provides motivation that helps students learn the basics. It can also give meaning to basic facts and skills. Students learn meaningful items more thoroughly and remember them for longer periods of time. Higher level learning will teach students to analyze what they are doing and to correctly use what they have learned. 
you will find teaching at these levels takes more time and is more challenging than teaching at lower levels because techniques must be learned, practiced, and refined. In flight instruction, there is only one level to aim for, and that's the top. You must use the lower levels as stepping stones, but if you instruct only at the lower levels, your students will never reach the top. Let's join Rick as he begins his instrument instructor check ride with a designated examiner. Well, Rick, let's uh, take a look at your paperwork before we begin the oral portion of your check ride. George, I've got everything right here. Would you like to see my 8710-1 Yeah, let's first? do that. Sure. Good. Looks like you have everything filled out correctly. By the way, Rick, remind your applicants that live in rural locations where there isn't a, an actual street address to include a map and a description of the physical location of their residence. I'll be sure to emphasize that. By the way, is there anything else I should pay special attention to when filling out the 8710-1 form for one of my students? You bet. Actually, uh, one, th one other thing that sometimes causes confusion is the entering of flight time. Many people don't realize that the minimum pilot experience required by the appropriate regulation must be entered. However, it's always recommended that you enter all pilot time. Now, let's see here. Your 8710 is filled out properly, except you still need to sign it. Next, I'd like to see your logbook to verify that you have the endorsements required by Advisory Circular 6165 for this check ride. George, there are three endorsements, one for aeronautical knowledge, one for flight proficiency, and the endorsement to certify completion of the prerequisites necessary for the practical test. All of your endorsements are correct. The only other documents that I need to see are your driver's license, pilot certificate, and a medical. I have everything right here. Good. Well, everything looks in order. You know, Rick, you meet all the requirements to have a gold seal on your CFI certificate. Really? I didn't know that. Actually, I didn't know what the requirements were. The requirements are spelled out in AC 6165. And essentially what you need is a commercial pilot certificate with an instrument rating, a ground instructor certificate with an advanced or an instrument rating, and also you need to have trained and recommended at least 10 applicants for the practical test of which eight have to pass on the first attempt within the previous 24 months. That's great, thanks. Do you have any questions before we start the oral portion of your checkride? Uh, no. Uh, let's get started. This issue of CFI Renewal has provided you with an overview of instructor professional responsibilities. The flight instructor has been granted a tremendous amount of responsibility to effectively train the future generation of pilots. It is imperative for the instructor to understand and meet these responsibilities while maintaining a high level of professionalism. One of the primary purposes of the CFI is to train the student to meet the standards required by the FAA. When an applicant walks through the door of the examiner's office, the applicant should be fully competent. The designated examiner's responsibility is to ensure the applicant is qualified to perform the duties of the rating or certificate sought. The instructor's endorsement in the applicant's logbook, in effect, is saying to the designated examiner, this person is a competent pilot today. Please confirm my finding and issue the temporary certificate and associated paperwork so this person can begin exercising pilot privileges. When a CFI writes an endorsement for an applicant, the regulations say that the CFI shall certify that he or she has found the applicant prepared to perform each of those operations competently as a recreational, private, or commercial pilot. Notice these endorsements do not even speak to the practical test, but rather to the applicant's ability to perform at the level of the certificate sought. It is with this responsibility the CFI must provide a professional and effective learning environment for every student. Remember, when teaching your students, communication is the key to training. If you and the student completely understand each other, the training program will be much more effective. Obviously, the techniques and suggestions that have been provided in this issue for improving flight instructing capabilities are not all inclusive. Learning to adjust and mold instructor actions to fit the situation and the student is the type of flexibility that makes great instructors.
Uh, I'm concerned that a lot of instructors are simply uh, sitting in the airplane, uh, protecting the airplane while the student teaches himself how to fly. I've seen a lot of those, and uh, that isn't professionalism at all. That's just building up flight time. I look back on all my training as very positive, and I had the same instructor throughout all my training. Um, he was very professional. He was very knowledgeable. Er he was always available to answer my questions. And even when I knew I was really screwing things up, he, you know, he was always calm. He always, you know, worked with me and talked me through, and I just felt really comfortable with everything that, that we did. I think the instructor's primary responsibility is to teach people to learn to fly, um, to help them pick their way through the process without endangering themselves, the equipment, or the rest of us. Well, I've had two separate flight instructors, and my experiences with all my flight training have been real positive. So just what are an instructor's professional responsibilities? As you can see, there are a wide variety of responses to this question. The reason for this may arise from the fact that no two individuals have identical training experiences, and the relationship between each instructor and student is truly unique. However, another conclusion can be drawn from these diverse answers. Stated simply, a flight instructor has a wide variety of responsibilities. In contrast to other aviation professions, the responsibilities of the flight instructor are not as clearly defined. Our duties as flight instructors include the supervision and oversight of student training, providing authorization for student privileges, and recommending applicants for practical tests. All of these tasks must be accomplished in full compliance with regulatory requirements. However, our larger responsibility to the aviation community is to provide a positive example, promote safety, and teach good judgment and decision-making skills to our students. To help achieve this goal, we must keep up to date on regulations, procedures, and other training material as information is changed. Every aspect of flight training, from teaching primary students to advanced instruction, requires that a combination of unique responsibilities be met. Let's explore these professional responsibilities by examining some specific instructing situations. For example, a successful first solo flight requires the fulfillment of many responsibilities by both flight instructor and student. Uh, it's interesting, in multi-engine training, we, we subject the student to all kinds of, uh, of emergencies, but yet the average instructor will turn loose a, a student for first solo, first time in an airplane alone, without having drilled him in how to avoid the little mishaps that could occur, like going off the runway and tearing the airplane all up. I just soloed and it was great. I've had my AMP for over four years and I've been working on airplanes for probably ten years. Oh, absolutely. You can only hang around these things so long, you know, before you want to fly them. I didn't hype them up on it, I guess you could say. So I just, uh, when I thought he was ready, he soloed. Actually, it wasn't a big deal at all. He, uh, he was really confident and when he was ready to solo, he soloed. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's one of the guys I work with. He's right over here. Rod, why don't you come over here? I'd like to tell you that I never told you this before, but you really did a good job. Thanks. The story we are about to relate concerns two student pilots who have reached the solo stage of their training. These scenarios will be used to provide valuable insight into the different ways in which professional responsibilities are met in any training situation. Meet Matt and Jennifer. Both of these students will solo for the first time today. But let's take a moment to examine just how well Matt and Jennifer are prepared for this momentous occasion. A bit of research into a student's flight training background can yield some interesting results. So let's take a look at how Jennifer's instructor, Steve, has supervised her training up to this point. When Jennifer first inquired about flying lessons, Steve recommended Advisory Circular 6112M, a student pilot guide that answers the questions most frequently asked by persons interested in flight training. This publication includes information about obtaining a medical and student pilot certificate, requirements for solo flights, endorsements, airman knowledge tests, practical tests, and flight training schools. Jennifer began assuming responsibility for her training from the first day. 
In addition to reviewing the student pilot guide, Jennifer promptly acquired all the necessary study materials, including a training syllabus which outlined the course of instruction. Other ways in which students share responsibility for training include scheduling lessons regularly, studying assigned material, asking questions for clarification of unclear subject areas, and being familiar with regulatory requirements. Steve understands the importance of meeting the regulatory training requirements prior to authorizing specific privileges such as solo flight. FAR 61.87 specifies the pre-solo aeronautical knowledge and flight training requirements. If the applicable regulation is not reviewed thoroughly, details in the requirements may be overlooked. For example, prior to solo flight in an airplane, a student must demonstrate proficiency performing go-arounds in various flight configurations, including turns, not only from final approach, but also from the landing flare. Another example is the forced landing procedure, which is routinely performed in the local practice area near suitable fields. However, prior to solo flight, students are required to demonstrate proficiency in forced landings initiated on takeoff, during initial climb, cruise, descent, and in the landing pattern. Some references in the regulations aren't as specific, stating only a general topic area. For example, emergency procedures and equipment malfunctions are listed as a flight training requirement prior to solo flight but the particular procedures and equipment to be covered are determined by the instructor. A comprehensive knowledge of aircraft systems and the actions to take if an equipment malfunction occurs is essential for any pilot regardless of the level of training. After a thorough ground lesson on aircraft systems, Jennifer's instructor, Steve, reinforced the proper procedures by repeatedly quizzing Jennifer during her flight training. The questions that Steve covered with Jennifer include, what is the significance of a zero indication on the suction gauge? What action should you take if the low voltage light illuminates in flight? What are the first indications of carburetor ice? In addition to the pre-solo flight training requirements, students must demonstrate satisfactory aeronautical knowledge of parts 61 and 91 of the regulations and the flight characteristics and operating limitations of the make and model of aircraft to be flown. The demonstration of knowledge must include satisfactory completion of a written examination. Additional information concerning the contents of the test is contained in Advisory Circular 61101. According to this circular, the content and number of exam questions are determined by the flight instructor. The written exam developed by Steve contains questions covering the pre-solo requirements of FAR Part 61, an adequate sampling of general operating rules found in FAR Part 91, and specific operating characteristics of the Cessna 172. Steve also included questions specifically pertaining to the local flight environment, such as ATC frequencies, local airspace requirements, and the effects of density altitude on aircraft performance. The FAA recommends that a record of the written exam, including the date, name of the student, and the test results, be kept for at least three years. In addition, FAR 61.189 requires that each flight instructor retain for three years a record containing the name of each person whose logbook or student pilot certificate has been endorsed for solo flight privileges, and the name of each person certified to take a written, flight, or practical test. The endorsements in Jennifer's logbook and on her student pilot certificate indicate that Jennifer has received the required flight training and is competent to solo in a Cessna 172. Advisory Circular 6165C, Certification, Pilots and Flight Instructors, provides recommended examples of the required endorsements for all areas of training. While Jennifer meets the requirements for solo flight and has received the proper endorsements, a look at Matt's training background reveals that some important areas have been overlooked. Although Matt's instructor, Karen, briefly discussed crosswind takeoffs and landings during ground training, 
Matt was never exposed to any in-flight instruction in crosswind technique. Forced landing procedures were introduced early in Matt's training, but never practiced on a regular basis. Several months ago, Matt completed a ground school class at the local community college. Karen believes Matt's attendance in class provided sufficient ground instruction and that the final exam taken in class meets the pre-solo written exam requirement. Although Matt may have learned the appropriate information in class, the knowledge must be demonstrated by satisfactory completion of a written exam administered and graded by Karen prior to endorsing Matt's certificate for solo flight. It has been two weeks since Matt has flown, and Karen forgot to impress upon him the necessity of having his certificate available for the solo flight. Now, Matt must rush home to retrieve it. While Matt is retrieving his certificate, let's check in on Jennifer again. Jennifer is procuring a weather briefing from flight service, while Steve checks the weather from a computerized service. The forecast that Jennifer received, and Steve confirmed, indicates excellent weather conditions for a first solo flight, with clear skies and winds from 170 at 5 knots. However, before the flight commences, Steve needs to discuss several issues with Jennifer. Defining procedures to be followed during the solo flight is one example of providing supervision and guidance during flight training. These procedures may include number of landings to be made, action to be taken if the wind increases or weather conditions deteriorate, and initiating go-arounds. Jennifer's flight is off to an excellent start. After three landings with Steve, the moment of truth arrives and Jennifer takes to the air in her first solo flight while Steve oversees from the control tower. Meanwhile, Matt returns to the airport with his student pilot certificate in hand, one step closer to solo. Since the scheduled lesson time is running short, Karen instructs Matt to forego the weather briefing and hurry to the airplane. Little do Matt and Karen know, but the forecast has changed since Jennifer received a weather briefing earlier. A westerly wind is forecast to blow at 15 to 20 knots within the next hour. Returning from her successful solo flight, Jennifer shares the excitement with Steve. At the same time, Matt is completing a hurried pre-flight. After completion of one landing with Karen, Matt continues the flight solo. During the course of the flight, the wind shifts to the west at 15 knots. Matt is uncomfortable with the crosswind and unsure of what action to take. Concerned over the wind, Matt becomes distracted, leading to a high approach for his final landing. Instead of initiating a go-around, Matt touches down on the last third of the runway. Realizing his predicament, Matt applies heavy braking in an attempt to turn off at the nearest taxiway, and a flat spot on the right tire is the result. Of course, Karen could have intervened if she had been watching the solo from the tower. So, what conclusion can be drawn from these solo scenarios? The issues are more complex than whether Steve is a competent instructor and Karen is not. What can be concluded is that our responsibilities as instructors encompass many areas and extend well beyond the duties required of us in the cockpit. We must be aware of how our actions can profoundly affect a student's flying experience and shape that person's attitudes regarding safety of flight. For example, Jennifer's first solo was a positive experience, which will result in increased confidence during future solo flights. The additional trust and respect for Steve's authority will enable Jennifer to respond to instruction with greater assurance. On the other hand, Matt's confidence and motivation have been shaken as a result of his experience. Matt will feel uneasy about future solo flights, and his enthusiasm for learning to fly has been dampened. One final consequence of this event is that Matt will have to pay for a new tire. Now let's take a moment to explore the professional responsibilities involving judgment training, decision making, and the examples we set for our students.
an instructor that has a casual approach towards anything, say weather, for instance, or pre-flight, uh, the, uh, the student has a, a tendency to, uh, to follow the same suit. If you have any questions, uh, just give us a call here. There's always an instructor here that can talk to you and help you out with anything that you might need. Okay. Because I think that most of the instructors here do exercise really good judgment. Yesterday evening, a private pilot with only 100 hours made a precautionary landing on a narrow dirt runway at a private airport. On a return flight from a business trip, the pilot, Kevin Smith, lost directional control during the landing and swerved off the runway into the grass. A witness recalled later that the pilot appeared to be having difficulty controlling the aircraft. Weather at the time of the incident was reported as marginal VFR due to incoming heavy thunderstorms. When the airplane was refueled this morning, 60 gallons was required to fill the 62-gallon tank. Now, moving on to the international scene. What does this situation have to do with an instructor's responsibilities? Clearly, the pilot in command in this example made some poor decisions that led to this incident. What is not always clear is what we, as instructors, could have done during training to prevent a situation like this from happening. Our actions sometimes speak louder than words, especially when judgment and decision-making skills are involved. By examining the events that led to the incident on March 13th, we can explore our responsibility to set a positive example for our students and show how our actions during instruction can influence pilot judgment long after training is completed. One of the first elements that affected Kevin Smith's flight was a decision made regarding the weather. On the morning of the flight, Kevin was running late. The time was 7.30, already one half hour past Kevin's planned departure time. Having obtained a computer printout of the forecast the night before, Kevin didn't bother to check the weather in the morning before his departure. Past experience may have had an impact on Kevin's decision-making process. Your influence as an instructor can discourage this type of poor judgment. Simply teaching a student how to obtain a weather briefing may not be enough. Ensuring that your student obtains a briefing before every flight develops good habits and emphasizes the importance of the weather check. Also, take time to discuss the conditions and require the student to arrive at a go, no-go decision. By ignoring a marginal forecast, or continuing a flight in poor weather, you may be sending the message that checking the weather serves no practical purpose. Even if a flying lesson is canceled based on forecast conditions that never materialize, you have taught your student a lesson in judgment. You might not earn much for this particular lesson, but you can at least impress upon the student that it is better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. A flight planning decision also played a part in Kevin's unfortunate incident. Kevin calculated total fuel burn for the trip based on a rule of thumb figure that his instructor had used during flight training. After reaching his destination, Kevin didn't request refueling. Based on his calculation, Kevin believed that sufficient fuel remained for the flight home. Students need to be taught to calculate fuel burn based on known conditions, using the performance charts in the pilot's operating handbook. An appropriate amount should be added to these figures to reach a conservative estimate and exceed regulatory minimums for VFR flight. By refueling at each destination on dual cross countries, you can illustrate the importance of never passing up a fuel stop. In addition, the fuel receipt can be used to calculate the actual aircraft fuel burn more accurately. Another way you can emphasize the importance of being fuel conscious is to set a minimum fuel limit for local flights. Stick to this limit even if you have no desire to wait for the fuel truck. Failing to recognize his own limitations was another factor that led Kevin one step closer to the unfortunate conclusion of his journey. In the presence of deteriorating weather, Kevin departed for the return flight home in the afternoon. Kevin didn't consider how fatigue and lack of extensive cross-country flying experience could affect his flight. 
you can help students realize that a relationship exists between personal limitations and safety of flight. If a student is feeling stressed, ill, or fatigued, suggest a ground lesson, shorten a flight, or reschedule a lesson. Uh, for example, there, there are a lot of people who have come in and said, I, I've got the flu, or I have this problem or that problem. I'm not going to fly and say, great, that's a good decision. We're using the FAA. I'm safe, checklist, ill. Boop, that's it. We don't fly. So then uh, there are other people that, that we've flown with, uh, particularly when they don't like stalls. They and decide you say, that's they're right. sick. They decide they're sick. And then you go over and, and get your model airplane, work through the stalls, and say, well, let's just go out and try some and see how they are, because what it is is just apprehension about not knowing what the airplane's doing. Illustrate to students that personal limitations apply to all pilots by rescheduling flight lessons when you are sick and limiting your working hours each day to avoid fatigue. Although FAR 61.195 limits flight instruction to eight hours within 24 consecutive hours, you may want to set a more restrictive personal limitation on both ground and flight instruction. The amount, type, and recency of flying experience is an additional factor to consider in the determination of personal limitations. Encourage students to schedule several lessons a week and don't allow excessive time to elapse between lessons or solo flights without review. Placing appropriate solo limitations in a student pilot's logbook demonstrates the importance of gaining sufficient experience in specific flight conditions, such as crosswinds. As Kevin's flight continued, the weather along the route grew increasingly hazardous. Since the airplane's fuel supply was almost exhausted, Kevin no longer had the option of diverting to avoid rapidly developing thunderstorms. With few alternatives left, Kevin was forced to land at the nearest airfield available, a small private airport with one narrow dirt runway. Due to the gusty wind conditions and Kevin's limited experience, the approach and landing were difficult. After touchdown, Kevin lost directional control of the airplane and finally came to a stop in the grass several yards to the side of the runway. So is it true with the rumors I've been hearing? Oh, about if Kevin had been your former student, could the impression you made during flight training have prevented this incident? That's not an easy question to answer. Obviously, an instructor can't be responsible for every decision made by a student after the completion of training. However, you do have a responsibility to provide a positive example to your students regarding judgment and decision making. I think one of the biggest things that I found is that a lot of students didn't know what a practical test guide was. They didn't know what a PTS was, where I came up with the information, or where I came up with my tolerances. I felt my instructors prepared me well. They got me into the practical test standard guide right away. Also, they showed me the course syllabus, so I knew where I was going with my training. So I have many applicants come in and they have no clue what's going to happen on the test because they haven't been reading the practical test standards or it hasn't been pushed onto them. Now let's revisit our student pilots from the previous scenarios. Time has passed, training has progressed, and our story resumes as Jennifer and Matt prepare for the private pilot practical test. Upon returning from the final flight lesson, Steve and Jennifer set aside time to prepare the 8710 Airman application for the practical test and to ensure that all the required logbook endorsements are made. An endorsement must be made certifying that the aeronautical knowledge requirements stated in FAR 61.105 and the flight proficiency standards of FAR 61.107 have been met. FAR 61.109 lists the aeronautical experience that Jennifer must have acquired during her flight training. In addition, FAR 61.39, which covers prerequisites for flight tests, requires an instructor endorsement certifying that the applicant has received flight instruction in preparation for the flight test within 60 days preceding the date of application. This endorsement also states that the applicant is competent to pass the test and has satisfactory knowledge of the FAA test subject areas in which the applicant was deficient. 
While preparing Jennifer for the check ride, Steve has been referring frequently to the private pilot practical test standards and required that Jennifer obtain a copy of the PTS at the beginning of training. Students, as well as instructors, should obtain an appropriate PTS to use as a reference throughout training, since it lists required maneuvers and procedures and defines the tolerances to which they will be performed. Jennifer has tabulated her flight time and filled out a copy of the 87101 form FAA Airman Certificate and or rating application. To guarantee that all requirements have been met, Steve also totals the flight time and refers to Jennifer's application copy to complete the form that Jennifer will furnish for the practical test. Now let's focus our attention on Matt, who has just returned from a local solo flight. An examination of Matt's logbook reveals that over 90 days have passed since Matt's first solo flight, and Karen has overlooked providing an additional solo endorsement. However, Karen endorsed Matt's logbook for the practical test, signed a blank application, and then departed on a trip for two weeks. Matt has been instructed to schedule any additional solo flights needed, add up his flight time, and complete the 8710 form prior to the check ride. Matt's practical test is scheduled for the same day as Jennifer's check ride. And finally, the day of reckoning has arrived the private pilot practical test. It's a perfect day for a check ride, but the FAA designated examiner discovers numerous errors on Matt's application and a quick logbook check exposes some serious training oversights. For one thing, only 2.5 hours of dual flight time has been logged within the last 60 days. FAR 61.109 requires three hours within 60 days prior to the practical test. An additional error reveals that only 18.3 hours of solo flight time has been logged. This is 1.7 short of the 20 hours required by FAR 61.109. Before the practical test has a chance to begin, Matt is disqualified. Still, if the check ride could have continued, Matt's chances of passing would have been marginal because he lacked recent flight experience. On the other hand, Jennifer, prepared and qualified for the check ride, will become a private pilot today. These scenarios provide a vivid illustration of the consequences of meeting or failing to meet our responsibilities. Although student pilots may require extra supervision, the examples that we have explored apply to all pilot training, from primary to advanced instruction. We have a responsibility to supervise training, comply with regulatory requirements, and provide a positive example to all of our students regardless of experience level. I remember having some trouble with my landings and my instructor, uh, I had a, a woman at the time and she kept suggesting that I hold it off, hold it off and, and I'd slam it into the ground. And uh, one day I got it and then I knew what she meant when she was saying hold it off, hold it off. And she said, what could I have said differently? And I said, well, nothing. Now that I have it, um, it makes sense to me. But I think, I think it's real important in teaching that you fashion what you're saying to the person you're saying it to and not maybe not have a standard way of, of presenting the information, but, but customizing it so it's relevant for who you're speaking to. You're probably curious as to whether Matt eventually became a private pilot. Matt finally passed the check ride and received his private pilot certificate. Prior to beginning training for an instrument rating, Matt decided to assume some responsibility for his training. And not surprisingly, Matt chose Steve as his next instructor.